Hi everybody. Welcome to Shark Dissection. I've kind of seen, I've been watching people pop up and I've seen some familiar faces, which is really nice. And I've seen some of you pick up the kits too, which was exciting. I love watching you guys pick it up and see how excited you are to get the kit to, to do this at home. So if you haven't met me before, I'm Shannon Egley. Um, at Jump, I'm the anatomical coordinator, which means that I run a surgical simulation lab. We do uh, mock surgeries, working with human cadavers, and we also do anatomical dissections in there. We, at uh, University of Illinois College of Medicine, I am an associate clinical anatomist, which means that I teach human anatomy to the med students. So it's kind of fun because I teach them uh, their anatomy before they go into being a doctor, and then once they're a surgeon, then they come over to the lab at Jump, and they get to practice uh, their skills and get better, not just dissecting things, but actually fixing things, which is really cool. My background, I'm a biomedical neuroscientist, so my favorite part of the body is the brain. Uh, usually I talk about it first, but in the shark, I decided to save it pretty much for the, the end when we get to the brain, but we'll talk about the nervous system kind of in the middle. Um, we'll talk about the heart. We'll talk about as many systems as we possibly can dur during the whole session. And uh, kind of the point of doing this is so that you get a chance to play with some really cool things you wouldn't get to play with probably at home. Uh, and you learn some new pieces of information and you can compare. So we'll talk a lot about how the shark anatomy uh, is very similar to human anatomy and how the shark physiology or how the shark works is how to, similar to how humans work. So that's kind of the big picture with comparative anatomy. So I'll walk through the kit with you. We'll make sure you have everything you need. And you should have got a, received a bag like this and your fish. We'll walk through the bag. I'm not the best at flipping between the screens, but I'll give it a shot. So when you take out the contents, first thing you should find is the big bag. It might be a big clear bag, it might be a big black bag. Um, it doesn't matter. That is going to go on your table like a tablecloth. So go ahead and open it up. <clears throat> You're not going to open it like you're putting it inside of a garbage can. You're just going to open it so it's flat like a tablecloth. Here's the open end. I'll just go to the other side so I don't accidentally open the whole thing. And now you've got a huge tablecloth. Move your other tools. And lay this flat. So it's double layered right now because at the very end of this, it's going to be the easiest cleanup ever. I feel like I should eat supper this way because I make a mess when I eat supper. So I should just lay a garbage bag down on the table, put my plate in the middle and everything. And at the end, I just wrap the bag over my food plate and whatever's left to throw it away so I don't have to clean anything. I'm kidding. Or am I? Okay. Then. Take your entire tray and put it right on top of the black bag. Back to where we were. Move my table just a little bit. So in some you can see me. Boom. Oh, well, that's going to mess with me. Okay, so now you have tray, you've got the book. If you open the book, you have a bookmark, by the way, and this is kind of cool. If you've done STEM with us before, you've seen these. It just has some little tips and fun STEM um, tidbits, I guess. But the apps are really awesome, especially the About Me 3D app. If you get a chance to go to the um, Google Play Store or the iPhone Store and download that, you can download like a coloring book, print off three or four of the pages. They're augmented reality games, coloring images. So you can color a heart uh, in real life. Take your app on your camera, point it at your picture, and then you have an augmented reality heart that pops out so that you can see what you colored. It's pretty sweet. And we're always adding stuff to this. So there are some games like an immune 
different game where you shoot viruses and bacteria. But little fun things to do. Um, it also has a link on here that tells you where to find out more about the STEM opportunities. For a while, we closed down our STEM program because obviously a lot of places are closing down, but we thought this is a really cool way to keep you active, um, let you stay involved with JUMP, and um, just have some fun. So when you open this up, this is the do try these at home. If you've been to our website, there are several things that you can try at home. Like uh, you can talk about bones a little bit and you can take some chicken bones after dinner or before dinner and put them in things like vinegar and watch what happens to them, cook them. But little scientific explorations you can do at home just to keep yourself busy or to learn a little bit more about how the body works. So kind of check into those if you get a chance. Done the jump website. Um, I believe if you Google jump and try this at home, do try this home at home, pulls it up. So the first page says think like a scientist. And so I'm kind of interesting. I am a late blooming scientist in a way. I waited till I was 30 to go back to school to be a, a neuroscientist because I wasn't re really sure if science was a thing for me. I was always very inquisitive and loved exploring and finding new things and educating myself, but I didn't know really what direction until I found um, biology and I just fell in love with it. But what I've learned over the years, so I started going to college for biology when I was 30. I waited way too long. I should have started a lot earlier. I would have had a lot more things um, to talk about probably. But uh, when I watched my kids, I learned that we are always scientists because when my small children are exploring the world, they grab like a yellow ball, they put it up to their mouth, they drew all over it, they're using their sensations. They're inquisitive, they wanna know what this is. And then the next time they see something that's round and yellow, they want to do the same thing, right? So they grab a lemon. So they think just because of their past experience, everything's going to be the same. But when they start learning that a ball doesn't taste exactly like a lemon, it's a totally different experience. Um, they're basically doing a scientific method. And they, they try things out and they experiment for themselves and they learn things. And that's kind of the point with these STEM classes to get you to open your mind and think about really fun, cool things. I didn't even think to ask, can everyone hear me? And I have you all muted, by the way. Awesome. So a thumbs up or a nod is really what I'm looking for. Every once in a while, I'll stop, check in, ask you questions. And then uh, I'll typically ask you things that you can nod your head yes or shake your head no to. But thank you for letting me know. I forgot to ask if you could hear me. I would have just wasted five minutes. So thinking like a scientist, using the scientific method, um, you try things out. You observe things. If you see a yellow round object, you put it in your mouth, you think, oh, this tastes like plastic. It's a ball, I don't know what else to do with it. But then you come to a lemon and you grab it and you taste it. In your past observations, it tastes like plastic, it's no big deal, it's kind of a fun thing to put in your mouth. Um, you put this yellow thing in, it's a totally different experience. Now, from that point on, you're gonna question everything that you do, this round and yellow. You know, Anything that you touch, is it gonna be more like a lemon? Is it gonna be more like a ball? So with this, it's the same idea. Um, you may not have walked into this course or found found us and thought, man, someday I want to be able to cut a shark apart and understand the anatomy and how it compares to us. But I know you've all had science classes, basic biology classes that describe the organ systems in the body, um, especially in humans. And here's a chance for you to actually uh, question and then make predictions on how you think they're going to be different. So when we get to something like the respiratory system, you know how the lungs work, I'm sure. You breathe air in, the air goes to the little alveoli, they exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide with the blood. The blood carries the fresh oxygenated um, particles off, right? So what about sharks though? Do sharks have lungs? Do other creatures have lungs? Or is that just a universal thing that everything that breathes has lungs? And it's not. In fact, today we'll find out about that. You know, trees breathe too. They don't have lungs. So question things, make predictions. How is the shark gets oxygen then if it doesn't breathe through lungs like we do? Um, experiment. Dissection is a form of experimentation. We're going to get it cut into it. You're going to get your hands really gross, hopefully um, gross in a cool way. I always love that when people are like, ooh, that's disgusting. Let me touch it. Or ooh, that's disgusting. Let me get a little closer. It's one of my favorite things. And if you've been in my lab before, you've seen the other people around you do the same thing. And then here, uh, you collect, analyze your data, and then modify and repeat. So what if you learn something about a shark? Does that necessarily apply to every fish out there. And yes, a shark is a fish. So sometimes I say the word fish, sometimes I say the word shark, it's, I'm referring to the same thing, unless I specifically say a bony fish versus a cartilaginous fish. So shark is cartilaginous. There are no bones in a shark. Uh, we'll talk about that a lot. Where like ray finned fish, 
Uh, they call them ray fin because they have, on the back of them, they have the dorsal fin. So that thing that on a shark pokes up out of the water. But those ray fin fish actually have spines that come out and they call them ray fin fish. We'll talk a little bit about that. But you can compare. Is what you're doing with the shark the same as it's gonna be with a fish? Is this fish gonna be the same as um, like a dolphin or a whale? And if you know, why would a dolphin and a whale be different than a fish? I mean, they all swim around the ocean. They live there. They don't have legs, they have fins. Dolphins and whales have to do something that, well, a lot of things, but one particular thing to stay alive that fish don't have to do. They have to come to the surface, right? Because dolphins and whales are actually mammals closer to us than fish are. So modify and repeat. Uh, hopefully in the next several weeks, we're gonna come out with some more at-home STEM projects where you'll get a chance to maybe dissect a starfish or an octopus, um, compare with your shark dissection and a fish. And who says you have to wait for a STEM course? If you see something cool in here and you really wanna experiment, just go out to the fish market and buy a whole fish and cut it open. Or if you enjoy fishing, Catch a fish, take it home, dissect it, and then you know, if you dissect it properly, you can cook it and eat it, right? So that's kind of the funny thing about me when I was a kid. I don't like killing things, but I come from a hunting family. So dissection really isn't in me. I didn't, I wasn't a big fan of it. I'm a physiologist. I like to keep things alive and see how they live. But my mind is, I'm just very inquisitive and I wanted to know, I understand how things work, but what are the parts? And if these parts change, which is the anatomy, how do things change? What's different? So it was interesting to me to learn about gills versus lungs or um, the liver in a shark versus the, li the liver in a human. Just structurally, what's different about us? And then we can understand functionally the physiology of how we're different. Right. Which leads us to page three, have the right tools. So to me, the right tool is actually what's in between your ears and not everybody has the right tool. Some people just wanna be told what to do. Uh, and I'm not putting down McDonald's worker, but I find that a lot of times if you go to McDonald's, the person that's helping you is a, just tell me what I have to do and I'll do it to get a paycheck. That's hopefully not the way you want to think. Hopefully you want to be inquisitive. If you're a scientist, you always want to understand why. Uh, and I know your parents are probably really close by, but I blame your parents. Uh, I blame my parents. My children are going to blame me. But when you're small, around the age of two, three, when you're learning words, one of the first words most kids usually learn is why. Why, 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 why? And it gets annoying. You know, you, maybe your parents heard why way too many times. And so after you say, why do I have to do this? They say, because I told you so, right? So they're busy, you're doing things, you're asking lots of questions, and they just say, well, because I told you so. Some people get in that mindset and they always do things because they're told so and they don't understand or want to know why. The tool that you want to have is a good brain that thinks scientifically to ask why. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why do I have to do that? Not in a like disobedient way, like why do I have to do that? But why is it that it's, we're doing it this way? So I've had jobs at McDonald's, but other jobs where I've worked in an industry where they just tell you what to do. And I asked a lot of why, well, why do we do it that way? And if my boss couldn't answer why we do it that way, I went to his boss and I would ask. And that's where I ended up. That's just the scientific method. Why, why does it work that way? So we're gonna talk about why fish breathes the way it does. We're going to talk about why the fish heart only has two chambers where a human heart has four. I mean, there are reasons. It doesn't just accidentally happen that way. There are reasons that it happens. So having the right tools, keep exploring, even beyond this. Uh, you've got dissection tools now. I mean, we recommend throwing them away, but it's okay for you to clean them properly and use them to dissect other things. You know, for a couple bucks, you could buy a fish at Dixon's Fish House or a fish market and dissect it, or you could um, buy, well, I'm trying to think of all the things you can order online. You could buy a frog, you know, and dissect the frog, something. But do keep exploring. Ask why. I don't know if you've ever dissected an earthworm. I actually have never done that, but um, I've seen diagrams, so I figure that's good enough for me right now. But keep exploring. Keep testing things. I have bigger things to explore than an earthworm right now, in my opinion. Um, be prepared. We've given you everything you need to dissect. Like I said, you can keep this, you can clean it up, you can do whatever you need to. Just make sure your parents know if you're keeping something and cleaning it up because everything has to be washed. Uh, the fish shark has been preserved. So the preservatives have to be scrubbed and cleaned. Um, it's best to use a 5% bleach solution, which if you wanna know what you should be using, you can actually Google that and it tells you how much bleach to put into a 
gallon of water. Or Dawn dish soap is really good at breaking away any of the grease and oils that the fish leaves behind. So washing once with soap and then a second time with uh, a mild bleach solution with gloves is probably the best so that you can keep exploring. Otherwise, you can just wrap the whole thing up and chuck it and the next time you come to us, we'll give you another one. All right, so here's what comes in your kit. First, your PPE, your personal protective equipment. So we protected the countertop with the garbage bag. Now you need to put the gloves on. I kind of jumped ahead and did that on mine because I was setting up. But put your gloves on. You have a set of medium gloves. It doesn't matter if you have large hands or small hands. Um, I usually wear a large or an extra large glove, but I put mediums on anyway for this reason. Finger. So one of the sensations I really want you to use a lot today is to touch things. If you're wearing medium gloves and you have small hands, the important thing is that you pull the finger tight. You want all of your fingertips to be tight so you can feel. So I actually learned a trick a long time ago where someone had taken a string, a friend of mine took a string and put it in the middle of a phone book. Back in the day, we had these thick books with yellow pages called phone books. And um, he put a string inside the phone book and he flipped a couple pages over the string and had me feel it. And when I got really good at feeling that string, flipped a couple more pages. And I just, I learned to really be sensitive with what I'm feeling for. I kind of imagine that's the same way that a blind person would certainly to read Braille. But the important thing with the gloves, is you want them tight so that you can feel all the structures. When we feel the skin, I want you to feel the little bumps on the skin, all the little scales. When we feel the teeth, I want you to be able to feel the teeth and the sharpness, but not so much that it cuts your glove open. If you break a glove, a Ziploc bag works. So you can take a um, shopping bag, like a Walmart Target bag, and put it over your, your hand, and it works like a mitten. You're not going to have all the individual fingers, but you can still feel through it, and you can still grab things while keeping your hand clean. Or a Ziploc bag, so you can actually see your fingers and see what you're touching. It's a little bit thicker, but it still works really well. You just, the, the stuff you're working with, it's technically not going to hurt you by getting on your skin, but it does smell like fish for days. So it stinks. I get rid of it. So gloves, eye protection, we included these disposable goggles for you so that you can uh, protect your eyes. If you have glasses, glasses are just fine too. So you can see me, I wear my glasses and the glass lenses on my glasses are actually taller than the goggles so they do more protection and they sit right up to my cheek too. So I know that if I splash something, it's not gonna go in like a regular pair of goggles. Um, what I just did is a no-no once you start touching the fish. So you don't want to start touching your glasses or your face. And the nice thing about, this is weird to say, the nice thing about the COVID um, problem is that we're more aware of touching our face and we're breathing what we're putting close to us. So once you start dissecting, you're going to really want to itch. This is a really good time to have a parent or a friend near so that you can say, oh, my eyes are itching or whatever, and they can take a cloth and get your eye for you but you have to have eye protection on. If you splash something in your eye, you need to go to a sink and rinse it for five minutes. So you have to stick your eye under there and keep it open, which is crazy hard, and let it run for five minutes to make sure it comes out. Um, five minutes is a lot of time uh, just to make sure everything is out, but it's a safe way to do it. So the next uh, one you wanna have an apron. I have a lab coat, so I don't need the apron, but we have included an apron for your kid. So you've got the apron, super simple. You just pop it so that the long straps are exposed, kind of like the lobster bib. I was watching you guys, some of you putting it on earlier, and it's just like you're going to Red Lobster or something and putting it on. So here's the top, double fold it. And you can either slide this over your head or you can break it and tie it. You can have a parent tie it around you, you can have a sibling tie it around you. If you have a sibling tie it around you, make sure that's the one that likes you. They don't tie it too tight. And then of course this can tie around the back. We just wanna make sure that if you splash something on your clothes, it'll all wash out, but it's stinky and it's nasty. And I'm a big fan of what happens in the lab stays in the lab, so I don't take it with me. Move it back just a little bit. Uh, so anything I splash on, my lab coat stays in the lab and it doesn't go out. So if I sit on a piece of furniture, I don't just take what was on my lab coat and put it on the furniture too. Uh, make sure there's a sink nearby for the splash reason. If you splash something on you, you can rinse it off quickly. Also, there's some juice in the bag with the shark, not like drinkable juice, but shark juice. You don't want that. It's safe to pour down the drain. Um, so you'll just want to pour it down the drain and let the water run for a minute just to flush it uh, down. 
So nearby sink, sharps, specimen safe disposal. Here's a really important tip. So we've given you sharp objects to play with. When you use them, always make sure you know where the tip is at. Biggest peeves when I'm working with med students or even doctors is that if somebody uses a scalpel and they sit it down and nobody else knows where it's at, someone may cover it with a piece of cloth. And if I go to pick that up, it'll slice right through the cloth and slice into me. So one of the first basic safety rules is always know where your sharps are. You have six pins like this. There are three that are an inch and a half, three that are two inches long. They should be in the top of your mat or in a little card that they're in. When you're done with them, always stick them in the mat. Don't leave them laying on the tray. Don't put them on the table or in the bag because later when you go to throw the bag away, if you scrunch the bag and there's a pin in there, you could scrunch it right into your hand. And you're, you're trying to compact it, so you're gonna smash that. So I always stick it in the top so I know. And I always make sure I know where all of my pins are. Uh, right now I have five in here because I pulled one out and put it right here. I stuck it in something else to hold. Now I have them all. Same with the sharp scissors. If you have the sharp tip scissors and that's what you're using, the sharp tip scissors will jam into the top of the foam too. I'm just a huge fan of making sure that the sharp tips, whether it's a needle or scissors or a scalpel or whatever it is, that I can oops, open it up and jam it in, protect it. Um, I'm actually a fan. Some of you got round tip scissors too. Have them. Yeah. I'm a fan of these. This is not like you're deep being demoted to kindergarten. These are actually great for dissecting. So when you're cutting into something and you can't see it, so you're cutting under skin, if you have sharp tip, you could stab right into a heart, you could stab into a liver or, the, or anything. With these, you go under the skin, you pull up, or any organ, you pull up on it, and the blunt tip will keep you from stabbing the wrong thing. You know exactly what you're cutting. So if you have those, those are great. If you have the sharp pointy ones, that's fine too. Just be careful when you poke in. All right. The tweezers, not so sharp. So the tweezers are for grabbing, obviously. They're also a prying tool or a spreading tool. Be open-minded. Not everything you see is just simple, like scissors just for cutting. Scissors are actually great spreaders for not cutting too, and I'll show you that. It's when you're in surgery, there's a, a dissection technique that doesn't cut. It allows parts of the body to separate themselves just by helping it. I'll show you that. So the back of these tweezers can actually be pushed into something and wiggle back and forth to spread. Like if you were going under a piece of tape, you get under there and just wiggle it back and forth until the tape was loose. Another sharp, here's your probe. On one side, it's kind of flat, but it still comes to a point. So you can see pointy, but flat. The other side is actually like a spear. So same thing. When you're pointing at something, you're trying to scratch or scrape something, you can use that tip. If you're just wanting to use the flat edge to get underneath something, you can do that. Again, I stab it into the foam. I wanna make sure everything that's sharp and all my tools are right here so I don't have to go digging around. You have a pen. The pen's for writing in the book, for taking little notes. There are a couple things I'll have you write down. It's gonna get really messy, um, just throw it away when you're all done, it's not a big deal. If you want, really want another clean pen, just get a hold of me and I'll get you one. Okay, so sharp specimen safe disposal. When we're all done with this, we have this bag that we're, one smooth technique, we'll reach into the garbage bag, we'll grab the tray and then just pull the whole garbage bag over it and throw it in the trash. Boom, done, super easy cleanup. And then the last thing there for safety, always have an adult within shout or shouting range or eyesight. That way, if something goes wrong, you can get help right away. I, if I'm doing anything that I'm possibly risking my own safety in the lab, I don't do it alone. I always make sure that I'm on speakerphone with somebody or I'm actually in the room with somebody even if they're doing something else. And in fact, right now I have somebody watching me from behind a mirror just in case something goes wrong, okay? So make sure you're safe. That's the big thing. We've given you all the tools you need to be prepared. You just need to make sure you're using them properly. Don't goof around. If you're doing a dissection, do exactly what you're asked to do. At the end of this, if you're curious about something, you can do whatever you want. But as we're going through the techniques to make sure that we're all on track and we're all seeing exactly what we need to see, just make sure that you're following the directions. Don't cut anything that you're not asked to cut. Um, don't jump ahead. Don't over stab something just because it's fun and cool to stab a shark. Um, if you really want to do that, do it safely after 
um, we're done with this dissection. So again, the kit materials, you have the manual we're looking at right now. You have the dogfish shark. So originally we were doing baby shark. I know that just saying that probably makes you think of that song. Um, but the baby sharks were only about four to six inches. So we got you a mommy shark or a daddy shark. It could be either. So there's your shark. It's in a big garbage bag and then there's a bag inside of it just in case something leaked. So for now, we're gonna put that up on top until the time that you're supposed to have it. So baby shark is not quite right, it's just a dogfish shark. And it says right in the name, dogfish, it's a fish. Um, they call it the dogfish because when fishermen had observed them swimming around, they swam in packs kind of like dogs. They're like, hey, look at that, they look like dogs. Cool, it's called a dogfish. Science isn't always super technical. Uh, now, hopefully, help you understand that when we start using anatomical terms. A lot of the tough anatomy with the human body is actually not that tough if you learn a couple words, right? Uh, we got our PPE, gloves, goggles, and aprons. You need to have it on. In fact, I should button my lab coat while I'm thinking that because I do splash. In fact, if you see the uh, white cloth down here on the floor, it's because the last dissection I did earlier, I wasn't paying attention and I dumped fish juice on the floor, on my shoes and everything. My dog and cat are gonna go nuts when I get home today. Dissection tray, you have a steel pan, 13 inches long. Your fish is going to be approximately 22 to 24 inches long. So it's not a perfect fit. The main part that you're working with will stay here. That's why you have this to cover the rest of your table. Plenty of space. Uh, the tweezers, ruler, you have a ruler just like this one. Um, it's accurate to length. It's paper, so it's very disposable. Don't worry about it. We're going to measure in inches and in centimeters. So if you don't know uh, how that works, we're going to walk through it. You have the probe. You have the pens. You have, I said, the tweezers already, and then the scissors. Yeah, scissors on there. And a table cover, which is also your disposable bag. So everything in that should be in there. We changed the size of the ruler because the fish got bigger, so we didn't need that little one. And then we changed the uh, two toothpicks to a bigger, thicker, better probe. And then the goggles were also better because they cleaned your face better, so they're safer. Okay, so jump steam at home lesson number one, shark autopsy. There's that baby shark again, but uh, there are a couple of problems with this. First, it's not a baby, and second, it's not an autopsy. So I thought it would be really cool when someone asked, so what should we do, what can we do with STEM now that we're not bringing people in? I said, let's send stuff to their house. Let's do a forensic autopsy. Um, so technically auto means self. Uh, so when they're talking about an autopsy, it's telling, talking about someone cutting their self apart. And not like you're gonna cut your arm with something. It means humans cutting apart humans. So when they're dead, not like a homicide type of situation. But an autopsy is when one person cuts another person open. That's not what we're doing today. We're not cutting humans. We're actually cutting a Humans are animals, but we're not all the same. So if you cut any, cutting any other animal apart, it's called a necropsy. Down here, it's not an autopsy, it's a necropsy. Forensic autopsies are there to find out what happened, what was the cause of death. So in a suspicious young person died, they do a forensic autopsy to find out why that happened. Necropsies are done the same way, to find out why the animal died. So, um, Actually, I'll ask you, I was about to tell you as an example, but look at this down here. So think about it. What kind of doctor do you think usually studies the death of other animals? So a mortician would study the death of human animals. Who would study the death of all other types of animals? Think about it a second. Well, what type of doctor studies animals or practices on animals, works on animals, does surgery on animals? The veterinarian, right? So veterinarians actually perform necropsies all the time. Why would it be important to learn why the animals die? Why would it be important if you were, if you were a park ranger and you suddenly started noticing that lots and lots of raccoons are dead all over the place? I like the answer, yeah, exactly, to prevent the death. So if these raccoons are starting to die in abnormal numbers, you wanna know why. So they would take the raccoons to a veterinarian and they'd find out what was going on. So it could be a new virus or a new bacteria, or it could be, you know, poachers or something, or somebody just killing the animals for what they call fun. 
So we want to find out what's going on. It could be just like we're dealing with the COVID situation. It's a, a new strain of an old virus. It could be some form of a rabies virus, right? And then we want to know if it's just isolated raccoons or if it's going to spread to other animals. So it's really important to learn why the animals die so that we can prevent the deaths, exactly. All right, and thank you for the participation. I don't mean to make you touch your keyboard and get all gross stuff on it, but if you're willing to do that, I appreciate it. I like that you're giving me feedback. Okay, so our fish today is the dogfish shark. We already said that. Sharks are one of the most primitive creatures on the planet, and I, I put quotes in primitive because they're really well-developed. They're not like primitive as in barbaric, you barely understand things. Sharks are pretty intelligent creatures, and we know that just by observing them. Sharks learn. They can behave differently. It's not just instinct. They smell blood and they attack. They can hunt. They can do a lot of things that show that they're intelligent. In fact, their brains, if, if you're a hunting shark, your brain is bigger than just a regular bottom feeding shark. So we know that they have more developed brains. So they're not so primitive. They're vertebrates just like us. So when you look up taxonomy, which I hope you had a chance to get the pre-lab kind of stuff, it's not something you had to do, but it was just kind of fun to go through. But there's some things on taxonomy that show how similar we are and how different we are too. So one of the things that you and sharks have in common are we're vertebrates, right? We have a vertebra, we have a skeleton, even though their skeleton is cartilage, ours is, um, is bone, we still have those similarities. So if you have a chance to look up the difference between human taxonomy and shark taxonomy, it's pretty cool how much we have in common. And today we'll cover a lot of those things that are very similar. Uh, they're cartilaginous fish, which puts them into a um, special group that there are about a thousand species of, and they're not all sharks. There are other fish like lampreys, which interesting will feed off of sharks because they attach, they suck to the side of shark and, and uh, clean the shark and actually can suck the blood off a of shark and stuff like that. But um, as far as sharks go, I've heard debating numbers. There are at least 400 different sharks. I've heard over 800 actually, when you look at some of the groups, because there are eight to 10 under the special group. Um, this is also interesting. Sharks are usually ectothermic, which means that they adapt to the environment around them. They're cold-blooded. Not all. In fact, your shark is not cold-blooded. Yours is endothermic. So endothermic means that they create their heat within. Endo means within. Thermo is referring to heat. Ecto means surrounding or the environment. So endothermic sharks have to have a way to heat up their body just like you do. And they have a special mechanism they've evolved. Um, tuna fish actually have the same one. If you've ever eaten a piece of tuna, they slice it across the fish and there's a really dark red area of meat. That's a special muscle that's full of blood. When you get cold, you have muscles and none specialized that are just doing this, but um, when you're cold, your muscles shake really fast. The blood goes through the muscles that are shaking. That blood is hot because the friction in the muscle heats it up and then boom, it goes back to your heart and to the other parts of your body to keep them warm. So if you just put your feet in cold water, your upper body starts shaking to warm the blood to push it down to the feet to keep your feet warm. Endothermic sharks work the same way. What's scary about that is we usually think about sharks being isolated to certain places. They migrate, but we know the patterns that they usually migrate to. And ectothermic shark usually stays to very similar areas that are the same temperature water so that its body can function properly. Just like you, if you're in cold water, you don't move very well. Warm water, you just wanna keep swimming around. So they stay in water that's comfortable. But some endothermic sharks can actually swim in fresh water and they'll swim up rivers. So if you look at a map of the United States and follow the Mississippi River up from the Gulf of Mexico, um, bull sharks have been known to swim into fresh water to lay babies because they're protected that way. And there's a lot of freshwater fish that are easy to get uh, catch. So bull sharks have actually swam all the way up the Mississippi River, up past Missouri and into Illinois, and they've gone into the Illinois River. So bull sharks, which are one of the more aggressive sharks, have actually been in Illinois. I couldn't find anything about Peoria itself, like Lake Peoria or anything ever having a bull shark in history, but it's kind of scary that they can get this far up here. And that's the more aggressive one. Most sharks are actually very um, docile, they're very timid, they don't like you. They, if you come around them, um, especially with any like an electric device like a camera or a microphone or something, they want to swim away, they don't like it, and we'll learn why in just a little bit. All right, so here's what I really want you to think about. Even though they spend their entire life in water, they breathe oxygen, they share a lot of features of land, similar land animals. If you watch the pre-lab about the sharks that can walk on land, and you can tell when we look at their skeleton, 
their shapes, how we're very similar, even though they don't have legs and we don't have fins. Okay. Last thing before we actually start getting into uh, the cool sharpness, these are terms that you really need to get familiar with. So external examination, when you're looking at the shark, there are some basic terms. One is dorsal, we'll use that a lot. Dorsal means the back. So anything that's towards the back of the fish, shark. So if I hold the fish and I have a fin back here, guess what we would call this fin? The dorsal fin, right? Because it's on the back. So these anatomical terms are more than just describing like directions, like left and right, or north, south, east, and west. They're actually for labeling too. So we can give you a word on the body and you can find it on your own. And that's why I say that human anatomy is actually not as bad as people make it out to you. You had a lot of med students, which I love and appreciate and, and uh, I've, all the ones I've gotten to know, but sometimes, man, they can be so whiny about anatomy. Like, oh, so tough. I don't get it, I don't get it. Just learn these basic terms and a lot of things fall into place. So the first one on a fish is dorsal. We don't use this term in humans except for on our brain. Totally different thing. So dorsal means towards the back. Ventral means towards the front. So if you were using it to describe an animal, dorsal is his back. Ventral is where it ventilates or breathes through. Like this guy, there's his nose right there. I guess I shouldn't be sexist and call it a him, I don't know yet. But there's its nose right here. It ventilates on this side. So this is the ventral side. Even if it were breathing through the mouth, it ventilates on that side. Uh, anterior or cranial means going towards the cranium, the head. So it means this direction. So if we're doing something down here and I say you need to move anterior or cranial, I mean go towards the head. If we're making a cut going this way, you're heading towards the head. If I say just the opposite and I say posterior or caudal, that means go towards the tail. It doesn't matter where you are. I can use the word caudal all the way up by the eyeball. It just means going towards the tail. So I can refer to the caudal area of the eye or if I make a cut in the eye, go caudally even though it's completely in the cranium, well, pretty much in the cranium, I can still use that term. So these are four words you wanna know. Cranial and caudal, which are also anterior, posterior. We use anterior and posterior on humans too. Our, our anterior sides are front, posterior is our back. Dorsal is the top, ventral is the bottom. So dorsal is technically the back of the fish. Ventral is the front of the fish. Lateral means to the side. It doesn't matter which side I'd use um, move right laterally or left laterally. And when I say that, I move my fingers the wrong way because I'm always talking about the patient. So if I say you're gonna make a cut laterally to the left, it looks like you're going to your right, but it's always the patient's. So if we describe the heart and we say the bulk of the, the muscle in the heart is actually pointing to the left, we mean the left side of the human or the patient. We say it's point, something's pointing to the right, it's the right side of the patient. Um, medial means something towards the middle. So if I say you're going to start a cut by the dorsal fin and you're going to move, well, uh, it's a bad example. So we'll go out here. This is the pectoral fin. So the pectoral fin is over laterally. This is lateral as you can get on the fish, all the way to the side. And I say we're going to start at the pectoral fin and move medially. That means you start right here at the corner of the pectoral fin and you move towards the midline, the middle of the shark. That's medial. Okay, these other ones are kind of fill-ins. Proximal means closer to the center, distal means further, not the same as medial. So if I have my arm out, uh, gotta find a way to switch faster. So if I'm talking about my arms and I'm holding my arm out like this, I could be holding my arm up like this or down and I'm still using the words proximal and distal. Because if I'm holding like this and I'm moving towards the midline, I'm not really moving to, like towards the sides, I'm moving straight down. So if you're referring to a fin or a flipper or a tail fin or our arms and legs, you're going to use proximal and distal a lot more. So if something is proximal means it's coming closer to the body. My elbow is proximal to my wrist. So it means it's closer than my wrist. And you can flip those words around. So if I say that my wrist is distal to my elbow, it means it's further away from my body than my elbow. And it, it's all perspective and how you use it. But if you ever read a medical chart or you open a medical textbook and they describe things like that, they always use these terms because these are, it's like me telling you, um, go, go run that way and turn right. 
I mean, it's super vague. If I want you to do something, I'm going to tell you exactly how far to run, and I'm going to tell you when to turn right and which way is right. So I'll tell you specifically north, south, east, west, X number of blocks. Next ones are superficial and deep. Superficial means closer to the surface of the body. Deep means closer to the middle, like guts of the body. And you can use this for skin. So we have a superficial layer of skin that you can see, and then we have deep skin, which is millimeters, not even less than that, a millimeter, below the superficial skin, but we call it deep, and it's still not all that deep. So superficial means make a cut towards the surface. Deep means you're going to go way down inside, right? Or at least inside somewhere. And the last one, the plane. So a sagittal cut means if I were to cut you right down the middle, whoop, like this, and split your left side from your right. I don't know if the image is backwards for you, but if I split your left and right apart, whoop, if I cut the fish right down the middle so I had two mirror images of fish, that's sagittal. Transverse means across. So um, I think transcontinental railroads that go transcontinental across the continent, right? So transverse means I'm going trans or across the body. Frontal is a tricky one because frontal, um, if I had, if this were a blade and I took it like this and I ran straight down and I cut from this ear to this ear, but kept going and I separated the front of my body off of the back of my body, that's a frontal plane. So we're gonna make some cuts today and we're gonna use those terms. I just want you to be familiar with those. If and I'll remind you the first several times that we use technical terms, what they mean, so that you're not totally stumped. But if you're going into any kind of biology, you really have to know all those terms. Human, animal, doesn't matter, other animal. All right, now it's time to open the fish. So open, examine, label. We're going to open it. Before you open, if you look, there's juice in there, right? So, in fact, mine has a big pocket of juice right here. When you open this, before you go anywhere, you're gonna take your scissors, go to a sink, or go to somewhere that has a drain. The chemical that's in here is called, well, part of it. It has a little bit of stuff called formalin. It's like formaldehyde. Formaldehyde you've probably heard of because it preserves things. Formaldehyde can be pretty nasty smelling, so um, nowadays we use formalin or other not so nasty, stinky stuff. Um, there's so little in it that it's actually safe to put in a drain and then flush down for like a minute with water. When you open this though, make sure you have controlled spill. So I would open it at an end. Okay, I just let the juice go down. You can open at the fish's head end, you can open the tail end. You're gonna cut across here, and then you're gonna flip it up and dump. Don't let the shark come out, just dump it all out, all the juice out. You see my juice is already starting to flow down. Dump it out, let it rinse down. Bring the whole bag back so that any of your spill was inside the sink or still in the bag so that we can spill right here in our controlled spill zone. So I'm gonna let you do that for like a couple minutes and I'll watch for you to come back. But go open up your bag, pour it, bring the bag with the fish back and then we're gonna put the fish on the table.
Awesome. So it looks like most of you are back. I can't see everybody's video. But of the ones I do see, it looks like uh, all but one are in the video. Great. Cool, so let's get going. They can catch up. This is pretty easy. We're gonna do some labeling. So up, oh, whoops, there we go. This is the sheet that I'm working with. When you're looking at the different structures, the pectoral fin, this is kind of easy to find if you know a little bit about human anatomy. If you've ever heard of people going to the gym and working out and they're building up their pecs, what part of their body are they talking about? Their chest, right? So if you take the fish and you look at its chest, it's already doing that motion. Yeah, man, I'm buff, look at me, Hooah! right? So there's the pectoral region, its chest. Oh, these are the pectoral fins. Yeah, Urgh! Urgh! gun show. All right, pectorals. Next, pelvic. So think about you, where's your pelvic region? It's talking about your hips, right? So if we go down, here's the abdomen. Here will be where the hips sit. Here would be like the back legs. So here you have the arms, the leg equivalent. This is a good time to figure out if you have a male or a female. If you have a female, it looks like this. There's the pelvic fin. If you have a male, there are actually two things that look like, they're called claspers. They look kind of like this. There's one on this side and there's one on this side that extend beyond the fin. That's how you know if it's a male. I have a girl. Let's see what happens when we go inside. Sometimes um, they were pregnant and didn't know. So pectoral fins, pelvic fins. Where will we find a dorsal fin? By the way, dorsal fin is probably one of the two most famous things about sharks, right? Dorsal fins are the ones that stick up out of the water when they're coming along. Dun -dun, dun -dun, dun -dun. Dorsal, right in the middle of the back. Dorsal fin pokes up. You should have a cut here. Should, I know you do. I know it's a safety thing. So they also call this the spiny dogfish shark because there's a spine that comes out. You can kind of feel where it was. It feels like a needle right here or a bone. But the spine would come up and go right above the dorsal fin. Uh, it has a toxin. It's actually a poisonous toxin, not poisonous to us. It's just toxic. So if they left it on here and you poked it into your finger, it would hurt. It'd be like a splinter that just keeps itching and itching and itching because it irritates your skin and your muscle. So it's more protection against other sea animals that come down because the dogfish shark, it gets to be 39 to 49 inches. It's not a huge shark. So we're talking like three to four feet. That's it. It's biggest. Sharks grow their entire life. So they'll grow to about a little under three feet, and then they grow little by little for the rest of their life. They don't stop. They don't have bones like we do. But at puberty, at the end of puberty, your bones lock into place and you'll always be at least that short. So it doesn't matter if you're six foot four, you're always gonna be at least that short the rest of your life. Later in life, you'll start shrinking a little bit, but you're never gonna grow taller. So the dorsal fin is one of those most famous things about the shark. Um, the other most famous thing is probably the mouth and the jaws, All right? Caudal fin. So we have pectoral, dorsal, pelvic, caudal means back here. So if you look, and this is kind of tricky terminology, most fins are paired. Here you have a pair, here you have a pair, here you have a pair, but technically they don't consider these two a pair, even though these are both dorsal. We call this one the anterior dorsal, so we must call this one the what? Posterior, right? Posterior dorsal. Um, you could use the words cranial to describe it, but that's not the technical term, and then this would be caudal. So this back one, the caudal fin, is all the way in the back. And you can see there are, I don't know if it was, at least a dozen different shapes for the caudal fins. Some of them are the same length on the top and the bottom. Some have a really long one. There's one shark that has a super long one. It uses like a whip to snap, kind of like shock. It's, it's a prey. 
but these are more for like uh, quick pulsing and steering when you're moving in. So those are the main fins. Next, lateral line. The lateral line is really important. You can see it's like a light gray line that goes all the way along the side. The lateral line goes the entire length of the shark, and it's there as an extra sensation that we don't have. Eh, kind of. And I'll explain that a little bit more later, but it's a pressure uh, receptor. So that if a, a shark is near something over here, water waves from the pressure movement from that thing, so if it's a little fish swimming here, the fish sends out waves in the water even if you can't see it. So the pressure changes on the shark, the shark feels it there, and then it can circle around. This is one of the big benefits of a cartilaginous skeleton is the shark can do a U-turn in no time. You've probably seen sharks that do circling around the prey. They're feeling where their prey is along the lateral line. They know, and as they keep circling, they know how far they are away from it. And if it tries to move out of that, they can dash off after it. So it's almost like they play with their food. And they're intelligent. They may be playing with their food. That's the lateral line we'll talk about more later. The gills, right here. So another thing that makes this different than a bony fish, so the ray fin fishes that have the, the rays coming into the dorsal fin, is that ray fin fishes or bony fish have an operculum. It's a covering. It's almost like a bony structure that goes across their gills to protect their gills. Another thing they could do, and you've probably seen this when you watch fish, is they move that thing. Almost like they're breathing with it, because they are. They're using it to pump water in and out of their gills. So a, a regular fish that we consider fish, bony fish, can stand perfectly still, and they'll sit there with their fins going around in circles, waving. They'll fan this thing to breathe back and forth, and they can sit and stare in an aquarium, at the aquarium right at you. Still, sharks can't do that. Sharks have to always be swimming because sharks can't float, right? Some people say sharks always have to swim because otherwise they'll drown. Um, actually, they just can't float. They can't float in one place. If they stop moving, they sink right to the bottom because a shark is missing something called a swim bladder. So if you were to cut down the lateral line and go deep, there's actually a tube, a hollow tube inside the fish that's full of air to help, like a floaty device, to help it with buoyancy. Sharks don't have that. So they have other methods to help them kind of float a little bit, but not completely. Like they have a lot of oil stored inside and we'll show you that too, to help them float because oil is lighter than water. But it's no, still not a great floating device. So sharks have the gills that have to have constant water running over them. They don't have the operculum. So when they swim, water comes up through the mouth, goes through, out the gills, and it's constantly bringing fresh water over the gills. The next structure is called a spiracle like this, there it is. Some people think that's an ear hole. Sharks don't have an external ear hole for hearing. They have a little tiny hole that you can barely even see. In fact, I have a hard time seeing them when I look. But the ear hole is just for water to go in and out of the ear just for pressure changes. But the spiracle, if a shark has it, great whites don't have it. So great whites have to constantly be moving to get water in through their mouths and across your gills. If you see a spiracle, this fish the shark can slow down and it can actually use its cheeks. It puffs its cheeks out like a chipmunk, sucking water in the spiracle. So it sucks it in and then it squeezes its cheek and pushes the water through its gills. So it can suck it in, push, suck it in, push. Bottom feeding sharks, the ones that like to hang out on the bottom that actually don't care about swimming because they're laying on the bottom, you'll see them puffing away real fast. They puff up their cheeks and blow, puff, blow, puff, blow. They're actually breathing that whole time. Okay. So spherical um, gills we got taken care of. The eyes pretty easy to figure out. The eyes and a shark are actually more like a human eye than any other fish, and we'll talk about that too. Like for instance, they have pupils that work. Other fish just have wide open pupils all the time. Okay. Lateral line we talked about. Nostril or a nair. They don't technically have a nose. We call the front part of the shark up here a rostrum. It's not like your nose. It's not a hollow cavity. That, that you breathe in and push the air back. These little nasal nares are closed, or we call them blind-ended because they don't go anywhere. This nostril kind of lets water flow in, brings in particles, and then pushes it back out. Same thing, this one flows in, pushes it back out. So when a fish smells something, or a shark smells something, it has super strong sense of smell. It can smell a tablespoon, just a drop of blood, and one side of an Olympic swimming pool from the other side of the swimming pool and go right at it. 
because little particles of that blood spread out in the pool. So when a shark gets closer to the dense source of particles, it knows it's getting closer to the prey that's actually doing the bleeding. Bloodhounds are exactly the same. When they smell a rabbit, there's their heads going back and forth smelling. They smell over here, there's not a lot of particles. They smell here, there's a lot of particles. So it must have gone this way. They go, smell here, not a lot, not a lot, right there, go that way. And they keep moving until they get the higher density of particles or where the particles like uh, rabbit's oils and stuff that rub off on plants. The bloodhound can follow that. Same with people oils. We don't think we're very smelly. It doesn't matter how much you scrub, a bloodhound can still smell you. Uh, apparently we're the one of the smelliest creatures out there to other creatures. Sharks, they don't want to eat us. Sharks really don't care about humans for food. They usually bite us because it was an accident. And they take one bite out and they go, oh, this is terrible. And they spit it out. It's like when you have a box of chocolates and you into that one that's lemon filled, ugh, gross. And you spit it back out. You didn't know that until you took a nibble, right? Sharks are the same way. Most of their sensation is actually around their mouth. So when they bite into something, they're actually feeling it. Unfortunately, they've got a lot of teeth. So when they bite into something to feel it, they usually leave marks. So that's why you don't hear about a lot of fatalities from sharks. There are actually more lightning strikes that kill people and shark attacks that kill people. They bite and they're like, ugh, this, this is terrible. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go find some fish or turtle somewhere. All right, so the rostrum I just mentioned is the, the nose. The nostrils are blind-ended, the particles come in and go out. Um, we're the same way. Particles go in your nose, you smell it, and then you breathe them out. I, I hate to be gross, but you ever been in an elevator and then you're next to somebody and they go and I'm not talking with their mouth. But then you have to smell it. Well, here's the disgusting thing. Those particles from the poo have actually drifted up, go into your nose, they bind to smell receptors in your nose. Luckily, you can blow your nose and get them out of there. But if you don't blow your nose, the mucus in your nose will actually take it, those poo particles, and put them down your throat and you end up digesting somebody else's particle, right? Same thing when you step in dog poo and you're like, ooh, this stinks. Well, now the dog poo particles are in your nose. You ever have a friend that says, this smells terrible, smell it. How stupid am I? You just said it smells terrible. I'm not gonna smell it. So anyway, care for what you smell because those particles actually get in your nose. Um, cloaca, so we go all the way from the rostrum straight down, caudally, caudal, 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 to the pelvic fins. If you open them up, that hole is called the cloaca. It's a common outlet for a lot of systems. Um, common not meaning it's in a lot of different animals. It is, but that's not what common means. Common means that these systems have a common passageway. So reproductive, this is where mating happens, this is where the baby's pups will come out of. Um, the eggs can come out of there. Uh, urination comes out of there. So after it filters this blood and pushes the urine out, it comes out the same hole. Feces comes out that hole. Uh, really, everything that the shark needs to get rid of can come out that hole. There's, there are other animals that are like that, like birds. And we'll talk a little more about that later. But that's called the cloaca, kind of a unique feature. And then the mouth, of course, going all the way back to the other end. And you can open up the mouth with your fingers. You can see the shark's teeth kind of projecting a little bit. You can see how many rows you have. I've got one clear row in the front. Oops, cracked his neck. Uh, there's a second row and there's a third row. So mine has three rows on the top. And there's a row right there. There's a row right there. And there's a row in the back, three rows on the bottom too. So sharks can have hundreds of teeth at one time. And as one tooth pops out, typically they'll swallow it or just let it drop to the ground. But another tooth from another row would just slide into its place. So it never sees a dentist, never gets cavities, constantly turning over. So it's a lot like uh, our teeth, just different shape, same structures. And then some sharks, when they swallow it, they actually swallow it on purpose because it can reabsorb the calcium and nutrients from the tooth um, for the minerals. So it's like harvesting its own stuff. So now your first little task up here, how long is your shark? If you haven't figured it out, you have a 12 inch ruler and you have a 22 plus inch shark. So how are you gonna do this? Here's my suggestion. Let's say, I'm gonna go over right here. There's the end of my shark, like this. I gotta keep him in camera, her, sorry, I have a her. Remember, not to the end of the ruler, to the zero. So I'm gonna pull the zero right up to where the rostrum starts. 
I'll go right down the midline. So a sagittal line right there. And now I've got a problem. There's no marker here. And if I dent it, and if I move it, the dent goes away. What I do, grab a pen, your first sharp object, right? Go down, I will mark it. And it asks for what, inches or centimeters? Look, I always know what you're measuring. It says centimeters, so I goofed, boom. Bring it back, starting at zero centimeters right there. Coming all the way down, I'm gonna take a pen Right here is 30. It doesn't go all the way to 31 centimeters. So I'm going just to 30 and I'm lightly pop. I can feel it go in a little bit and I let go. You don't need to stab it in, just let it in. Move this down. And do a second measurement. Ah, my shark is longer than another 30 centimeters. So I'm gonna go to the zero, whoops, right there. Right there. I have another pen going all the way down. Mm, my broken tail is a little bit of length extra. I'm gonna put that back together. I'm gonna stick that at the 30 pen. Pop it then. And then my last one. Whoop. Oh no. Perfect. I can still see the hole. Ta da. Go a little bit deeper, but not too deep. I don't want to go all the way through. And be careful when you're stabbing something with a pen that it doesn't go through and get your hand because the formalin is a skin irritant if you leave it on for too long. And if you puncture your skin with it, it'll itch like crazy and it'll probably turn red and puff up. It's not toxic, it's not going to kill you unless you have large amounts of it going in. Oops. Um, but you don't want to get it in your skin if you don't have to because it itches like crazy. Cool, and it looks like mine goes to, I don't know if you can see on your screen, mine goes to 11 and it's like uh, another seven tick marks. So I've got 30 plus 30 plus 11, so I've got 41 centimeters and seven tick marks, or seven millimeters. It's not asking for millimeters, it's just asking for inches. So I have, what did I say, 72. 72 centimeters is mine. Anybody beat 72? Yeah, I got the big one, cool. Last time I got the small one, the runt. We're not gonna compare with everybody in the group because that'll take too long, but just in general, these are supposed to be 22 to 24 inches. Originally we were baby sharks that were six inches and that just wasn't good enough. So you can do one of two things. You can either remeasure into inches or if you have a parent within shout reach that has a cell phone with a calculator, which is everybody, you can have them take whatever the length in centimeters it is, divided by 2.54. So for every oops, inch, you actually have 2.54 centimeters. I learned that conversion right after high school when I worked in a factory and had to measure things all the time. And then I realized I didn't like working in a factory and I didn't like measuring things all the time. Right. So if you've got that, great. Next is wingspan. So I didn't mention this, but when I was talking about the, the fish that can stay still and they keep moving their fins around so that they can move backwards, you ever seen this fish go backwards? And then they go forward like they're moving a car and looking for a parking spot. Sharks can't do that. Sharks have limited mobility of their fins. So a shark's fins are typically not for swimming around like a propeller. Shark's fins are typically actually like plane wings. So they're there to tilt a little bit to get lift or move back and forth. So to get a wingspan, here's what I'll do with my shark. I should put my shark down. Put it however you want. Now let the wings oops, stretch out. Boom. Let the other wing stretch out. I'll tag it. I don't want to straighten them out because that's not natural. I pull it until it feels like it's comfortable. So now it's like wings on a plane, like a military fighter plane. Since it wants to know it in centimeters first. 
centimeters are nice to measure with and then convert to inches uh, for me. There we go. Because I like that every millimeter, that tick mark where I don't have to do all the weird fraction stuff right away. So I'm at zero on this side, all the way over. My wingspan is, ooh, man, it's for this point. I'll just keep tilting my ruler until I get, yeah, there it was, right there. 24, and I'm gonna have to lean to four. So 24 centimeters and four millimeters. So I have to round down to 24. It's, at the very end of the school year, I had to help teach my daughter rounding. She doesn't like rounding down, especially when it comes to money and how much money she can get. She always wants to round up. So it's three dollars and seven cents, Dad. Can you give me four dollars? We'll call it good. All right. Got the wingspan. Boom. Next. Systems. Now we're going to start digging in. So we're going to go one system at a time, deeper and deeper and deeper. Of course, the first one's the integumentary system. Shark skin is not the same as the skin on you or me. So our skin is actually a series of cells, individual little tiny cells, little living like organism type cells that bump into each other. So it's almost like a sheet like this. And if each one of these little squares were a cell, they just bump. Nothing can get through because we have special chemicals that glue that sheet together. And you can experience this if you get a sunburn and then it starts peeling. All those individual little cells are, are peeling off together. They're glued together. If you don't witness the peeling, you're still shedding those dead cells. Um, they cause things like dandruff or uh, dust bunnies on your bed or the dust in your bed. Most of the dust in your house isn't dirt. It's actually human cells. So that's pretty gross for most people. Uh, all that stuff on your bed, that's all you laying under there mostly, or your dog or your cat or whoever. Okay, so the shark skin's a little bit different. Shark skin's more like shingles on a house where they overlay each other, and they're not cells. They're designed like teeth. So when you think of your teeth, if you look up a tooth model, you've got the enamel on the outside. It's the pretty white. That's the hardest part of the body, is tooth enamel. These little scales have an enamel on the outside, just like a tooth. The inside, the part that gives it strength on the inside is called dentin. These actually have dentin in them too. In the center, you have a pulp cavity in a tooth. Each one of these scales has a pulp cavity. So it's not like a, a flat shingle. It's actually like a tooth, every single one of them. And you can feel them coming across. They're a little bit rough. If you take your finger back the other way, you can hear them. Use all your senses. Use your touch, feel things. Feel how squishy, how firm a slimy, a scratchy, how whatever. Use your vision, observe the colors, observe how things compare. Listen, listen to the scales as you come back compared to when you go forward. So you can definitely tell they have a direction. You can see them in the picture too. You go this way and I rub across smoothly. I go this way and they catch. Uh, you might wanna stay away from the smells. I mean, you can't help but smell the fishiness in some of the form ones. And then the taste you totally want to avoid, but use your sensations. What would be a benefit of the, sh the shark having all these teeny tiny little teeth that are really hard substances all across the outside of its body? Think about it. It's kind of like chain mail for knights. You know, medieval knights had the chain mail. They get attacked. They can resist a lot more puncture, right? So, and if you stuck the pin in, you could feel it. You have to push and push and then pop. It finally slides in between. I'm almost guaranteed you didn't actually puncture a denticle, which is a scale. You went in between it and popped the skin. Right. So that's one thing about the skin. The other thing is the, the color. If you look at the top, it's dark gray. It's kind of like one of the um, characteristics of most shark that we think of. Of course, if it's the bottom feeder, it's going to have a pattern, sometimes like a light brown that looks more like the ground. But the bottom is pale. The reason is it's a hunter, it's a predator, but it's also prey. So when you're a hunter, you're a fisherman or a, you know, a small shark, you're a bird, and the shark's underwater, as you look down, you look at the dark, deep depths of the water, 
Everything looks dark. Gray sharks moving down deep in there, hiding, camouflage from you, right? But if you're its prey, its prey is typically below it. So it's swimming along, looking, feeling the pressure for its prey. The prey down here is looking up out of the water towards the sun. So this is the view. Okay. Imagine that the white book is the sunshine coming down into the water. So it kind of blends in as it's swimming by, right? This is broken tail. But it's awesome because it's colored that way intentionally. It's not just because it has a nice tan on the top of it, and that's how they tan. Because as a predator, it needs the white. As prey, it needs the dark skin on the top. All right. That's the skin. Oop. And that's why it's colored that way. Next is locomotion, its ability to move. So it's skeleton and its muscles. You can feel how dense this group of muscles going on the back are. Super dense. Right? The reason it's like that is because when it swims, remember the fins can't propel like a propeller like other fish do. It can't swim backwards, it can't swim forward with the fins. The fins are just for direction. So what it does, if it's shaped like a torpedo like this one, it has powerful back muscles along its tail that whip real quick and it can wiggle along real fast and maneuver. If it's a fat, like a whale shark, a real big blubbery shark, it actually wiggles. It uses more of these muscles up here and kind of wobbles through the water, not moving super fast. Right. So it, it's locomotion, it's design. A lot of its muscles are attached to bones just like we do. And bones, I said bones. Cartilage, just like we do to our bones. But it also has a lot of attachments to the skin. So they can help use the skin to pull back and forth like, like a sail on a boat use a skin and the same thing with its fins. It's not just um, about muscle to bone or muscle to cartilage. You're the same way in your face. You actually have a lot of muscles in your face that don't attach bone to bone. They attach skin to bone so you can smile or frown or open your eyes or look surprised and raise your eyebrows and things. Right? So with locomotion, the skeleton's for, for support. It's also for protection. If you flip to the next page, you can see the outline of the, of the skeleton. This is a dogfish skeleton. This is an awesome picture. It's actually somebody at Jump that drew these, some of these pictures for us just for you guys. Uh, his name's Eric and he did a fantastic job uh, sketching out a skeleton. Uh, the same thing, people that put these together. So I wrote the material and then our marketing department just went crazy and, and did this. It's just an amazing job that they did. So if you look at this skeleton compared to ours, you can see the heads, very similar. We have a cranium, they have a chondrocranium. The skull, I see people doing the baby shark song, great. The skull on us, hard, protects the brain. The skull on this, when we cut it open, you'll see it's still hard and protects the brain, but it's called chondro, which means cartilage, um, cranium, which means the skull. If you feel the neck on your shark, so you can feel that bony, hard skull. Here are the spiracles. If you move caudally immediately, you can feel there's the dense top of the skull. Wiggle your hand down a little bit and you can feel muscle. And you can feel its head. So it can shake. No, it can go, yeah, oh yeah, I definitely agree. No, 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 no. It's krill for dinner tonight. Right. Feel its neck. Later on, we're going to do the same thing. We're actually going to dissect the, um, separate the skull from the vertebra. So this is a good location now. If you follow down, even with the diagram, if you're looking, it has two arm-like structures, the fins go down. It has a hip, a pelvic region, and two leg-like structures. And of course, it has its tail coming off. We have something similar to a tail. Back here, we have the sacrum and the cossacks with the little bones at the very end. So you can look and you can see, compared to this guy, just where the bones are at. Right? You can see the rib line, just like this. You're not really gonna feel the ribs so much, but when we cut in, you're gonna see the muscles that go over the ribs. And then a big technique to use to find things is palpation. So if I wanna find, like I just did with the neck, if I wanna find something I can't see with my eyes, I feel for what I know. I can feel the dorsal fin, I can feel the vertebra going up. 
I can feel the base of the skull, and so I know the neck is there. So I'll palpate, and then I'll make my incision. Not yet, but soon. Um, we do the same thing. Your doctor will feel different parts of your body to see if it's sore or tender. Um, palpitation is different. That's like when your heart, heart palpitates, you have irregular rhythms or it, it jumps weird like. Not the same. Palpate is the touch. Okay. We're going to talk more about the muscular system later when we cut into the body. And then let's go to the nervous system. Sensations. And then we're going to look at respiratory and cut in. So senses. Five same senses as you. You know, if they say if you have a sixth sense, you have some extra sense. Where are most of your sensations at? Point to your body. Don't touch it. Just point to where most of your sensations are at. I feel like Dr. Eva. Nice kitty, Mr. Bigel Sharksworth. Yep, your head. Same with the shark. Most of its sensations are based around its head. It has some extra ones we're going to talk about, but when you think about things like smell, we already talked about smell. A shark smell is so sensitive when we cut in here, you're going to find a big bulb, just a huge bulb called the olfactory bulb. All the receptors for different smells go straight to that bulb. And there's so many neurons coming out of it, it's very dense going right to a specialized part of the brain. So it smells and identifies really fast. We're the same way. We have little tiny strips we call an olfactory bulb, but our smell is nowhere near like most other animals. We depend more on like sight for how we hunt and do things. So there's your smell. Sight, the eyeball is a lot like our eyeball. This is a picture of a human eyeball. So when we get in there, you're gonna see the different layers. There's one extra layer that a shark has that a human doesn't. It's called the tapetum lucidum. Right back here behind this yellow layer, the yellow in the picture is the retina. That's where you see your rods and your cones where light hits. It actually has a reflective layer that's like a mirror back there. So when light comes in, for us, it goes and hits the rods and cones on the retina and we, we see our image. With a shark or a cat or dogs, there's a mirror-like layer back there that the light comes in. They see an image, but it bounces off the mirror and they actually see it a second time. So they get at least twice the vision at night that we do from very little light. That's why if you see a, a cat at night and you shine a flashlight at it, its eyes glow and same with dogs. Different species have different colors. So a shark would be the same way. If a shark came swimming by and you had a light on it, you'd see this almost like silver reflection. Like my dog, um, I have a Bouvier. When you shine a light at her at night, her eyes are like an orangish red, very, very eerie, but a friend of mine has a schnauzer and you shine a light at it and it's like a teal color. So different animals that have that, they're all kinds of different colors, it's pretty cool, but it helps them see in dark, dark water or at night for the situation with uh, like dogs and cats. So the sight, a lot like ours, we're gonna cut the eyeball out in just a little while. Touch, so they have touch receptors all over their body, just like we do. Where do you think your best touch receptors are? Where do you get the best sensation when you touch something? Kind of the term gives it away, but fingertips, right? So you have the best sensation with your fingertips and your lips. So when you are a baby, your best two sensations, fingers, lips, you give a baby a toy, what do they do? They grab it and then they immediately shove it to their mouth, right? So they bring it in and they wanna feel it. That's their way to feel it with your, their fingers and their lips at the same time. Sharks are a lot the same way. Their touch sensors are the most abundant in their mouth. So when they wanna know what something's like, they'll nibble on it. Unfortunately, you have all those teeth, so when you nibble, you have a tendency to bite things. Um, if you haven't looked up the cookie cutter shark, you sh should check it out. It actually takes like cookie cutter circles out of other animals, leaves the prey alive, but just pink, pink, nibbles on it and just takes bites. That's why there are more shark attacks that people live through than fatalities, because when they, they feel it, they're kind of like, hey, who are you? And they'll nibble a little bit, and they're like, oh yeah, you're not another shark. If this shark nibbles on another shark, that armor is gonna protect them, they're gonna kind of know it. So, and uh, sharks, interestingly, also use that technique for mating. They nibble on other sharks to let them know that they're ready. All right, next one, taste. Sharks taste actually isn't as sensitive as you would think. So. Their taste buds are not on their tongue. Their tongue's not a traditional tongue, like it's muscular and it has taste buds all over it. It's actually more cartilage based and it's more for pressure. It has muscle underneath to push up to smash the prey at the roof of the mouth. So their taste buds are on the roof of the mouth. And if you need to get in there, you can use the probe, you can use your tweezers, um, you can use your finger to pull up, but 
if you pull too much, then it might rip your glove. So if you look in, you'll see a bunch of ridges like we have across the top. How close I can get. Yeah, it blurs a little bit. Um, but you can also, when you feel on it, kind of like a cat, you know, it has kind of that grippiness on the tongue. You can feel those too. We're going to cut the mouth open and you'll feel it later. So taste, not as sensitive as you would think. All right. Hearing, sharks are interesting. Their ears are completely internal. Ours, we have an external ear, a middle ear, and an internal ear. Sharks just have the middle ear, and they have a tube that flows down into the middle ear, just for water to circulate through. They use the water pressure to help them hear. We use air pressure, so air actually travels, vibrates, travels into our ear. This is a funnel that collects that sound, shakes three little bones, incus malleus and stapes, and then vibrates our hearing mechanism that's in the inner ear. Sharks just skip all that, the water flows through, vibrates that inner ear and tells them where things are at. But that's not it. That lateral line we pointed at earlier is a special sensation for pressure on the next page. But that pressure, it's not specifically hearing, it's not hearing it, it's detecting the movement changes in the water around them. So on the top of the next page it says pressure. The lateral line is full of a bunch of little tiny pores that when water goes into it, there are hair cells inside of it that tingle or tingle. Um, they move a little bit and they send tingle sensations to the shark. You actually have the same thing in your ear, little hair cells that aren't made out of hair, but they're receptors that wiggle. So anytime the shark's near something and it feels that movement of water pressure, it knows. Even if it can't see it or smell it or sense it in any other way, it knows. So sharks are also known when they move, they send water away from them. The water pressure bounces off of rocks and comes back and hits this lateral line and they know how close they are to a rock. What other animal sends out a signal, waits for that signal to come back, and then knows where it is in space? Think about it. I'll give you a hint. We name a superhero after it. Exactly. Bats. So bats use echolocation. They send out sound waves, bounce off rocks, trees, insects, comes back, and they know where they are. Sharks just move, and just their movement, they know their pattern. If that changes, they know there's a rock or a structure, so they can circle around. They can stay away from the rock, they can circle around, and if the rock stays put, it knows it's not alive. Right? So a fish is best off by just not moving and staying still, and the, the shark will hopefully think it's not a fish. That's the pressure. And the last one's electroreception, and I keep looking at these and thinking I want to talk about them. I don't know if you can see on mine. See all the little tiny holes? Super clear on mine. Ah, the camera's. Definitely not doing it. There they are. Little tiny black dots. You have them too. So these little black dots are moving all along here. You flip it over, you see all the little black dots. They look like pores. Oh boy. Come on, quality of picture. Not so great. You can see kind of speckles. So those are also little pores, but they're filled with jelly. And they're for electroreception. So if you've ever seen somebody get hooked up to an EKG, an electrocardiogram for their heart. We can detect their electrical signals off their heart because the, well, the muscle sends off electricity and we can detect those. Sharks have these little pores that do the same thing. They're filled with a jelly, like an electro jelly. They detect electricity moving through the water around them. That way, um, it, well, it's exactly like an EKG. When they bite their prey and they kill it, they're fighting it and ripping it. When the prey's heart stops beating, they know because the electrical signal doesn't get there anymore. So they know when they've killed their prey and they can just chomp it up. Um, if prey is close to them, it can detect muscle movements. So when you twitch a muscle, it sends off electrical impulses that we could detect. Sharks have a natural sensor for that. They detect it. They know when you're swimming around. So if you're sitting still like a rock, don't move a muscle because they can detect that electrical movement in your muscles too. And those are call, called the ampullae of Lorenzini, little tiny jelly-filled pores for electricity. So two extra sensations we actually don't have. Right? Reproduction, we kind of talked about this. It's a lot like a bird. A chicken. You've got the cloaca, and when when sharks reproduce, and we'll look at the structures on the inside, they actually have four methods. And hopefully, you had a chance to do the prelab and look them up. So they can have eggs that they lay comes out the cloaca, and they can drop the eggs in the water around them, and you know, eggs hatch just like a chicken or other fish. They can have eggs, but they keep the eggs inside their ovary or uterus inside until they hatch, and then the live sharks come out, which is is good because what would it do for that baby shark? 
what's the disadvantage of just um, laying an egg and leaving it in the ocean? You know, other fish come along and eat it, right? I mean, sharks are prey at some point of their life to other things. So by developing it, then when the baby shark's born, the shark pup, then it has a fighting chance because it can swim, it has teeth, it's actually kind of developed. Another thing they can do is that they never have an actual egg. They just develop off a yolk sac, which is just like us um, developing off a of placenta. So the baby sharks develop in here, and then when they're ready to go, boop, they let go of them. The disadvantage to that is that they can't have a lot of pups at one time because there's a lot of space taken up in here. And then the last one was probably the coolest one. Did anybody get a chance to look at the uh, intrauterine cannibalism? Oh, you got to look it up. So in the in the email you were sent, it talks about the four methods. Intrauterine cannibalism. So when we crack this one open, we'll be able to look at her ovaries and uterus over here on the side. Each site will develop 50 pups. 50 pups, 50 pups. They don't connect to each other. So these 50 pups start growing. That's way too many. So when the first one gets to about four inches long, it will eat all the other ones. So it eats all its brothers and sisters. So when it's born, it's well fed, it's well developed. And then when they give birth, they give birth to two of them, one from each side, all the others were eaten. That's kind of cool, eerie, strange, but tiger sharks do that if you get a chance to look it up. We'll talk about reproduction just a little bit. Uh, when we cut inside and we'll look at the organs. And then the last thing we're looking at from the outside is respiration, and that's the gills, which we already talked about. So gills, if you want to know if a fish is fresh or not, you can take its operculum and peel it back. And if the gills are a nice bright red, you know it's fresh. If they're dark red, that means it's been sitting for a long time because the blood that's in the gills picking up oxygen, when it's oxygenated, it turns red. When it's deoxygenated, then it turns more of a like wine color, like burgundy. Some people say it turns blue. It doesn't turn blue, it just turns like a deep red. So that's how you know. The same with us. When our lungs pick up oxygen, it makes our, our blood turn brighter red. When it's deoxygenated, it turns a darker red. Okay. So let's look inside. Here's where we're gonna make our first cuts. All right, safety. Oops, and I forgot to kind of plug these across the bottom. Um, we're doing this at Jump. Jump is owned by OSF. It's a collaboration with the University of Illinois College of Medicine. But sliding up here, this is actually made possible because PNC gives a lot of grants to uh, make the kits inexpensive. Like when you got your kit, it blew my mind how little we could spend on getting a kit to you. So pretty awesome. And I'm kind of sending a thank you to PNC for letting us do this. And hopefully pretty soon we're gonna have other ones like starfish, and, um, owl pellets, maybe where you dissect an owl pellet, find out what it ate for supper the last couple nights. Um, starfish, octopus, squid, uh, whatever I can get my hands on. Uh, if you're interested in that, let us know. Okay, first cut. Look at this. It says, read and listen carefully for instructions. The red line is where you're going to make the cut, but how you're going to make it, we're going to do this nice and carefully. So grab your scissors. I like the blunt tip ones, but you can use whatever you feel comfortable with. And it says, place your shark ventral side up, Ventral, belly up. Using your scissors, cut from the left lateral. So which is the left lateral? Is it the side next to the company logos or is it the side next to the book? Imagine you're the shark. This is the shark's left, right? Correct, I mean. <laughs> so we're gonna cut from here. And it says, you're gonna cut, cut from the left lateral corner of the jaw, caudally, so we're going what direction? towards the tail, but it says caudally and med medially to the gills. So towards the middle from the gills. So when you're cutting, don't cut the gills. Cut this way, but you're gonna cut down to, 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 to stopping at the most cranial proximal corner of the left pectoral fin. Here's your pectoral fin. You're going to the most cranial and then, oops, yeah, cranial and proximal, closest to the body. You're going to right here. So if you're doing connect the dots, you imagine going from here, tick, 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 not hitting the gills, but coming over and connecting to there. So that's what we're going to do first. I'll open up. Actually, I'm going to flip around because I'm right-handed. Right here. I want to make sure I'm getting the left side. Open up, jaws. 
I get my scissors in and I snip. I cut a little bit. Remember, this skin's like armor, so you're gonna have to do a couple snips. Snip, little snip. Ooh, he's got something nasty in his mouth, gross. We're about to find out what it is. Snip, snip, snip. Just cut through the jaw, snip again, snip again, snip again. Avoid the gills, snip again, snip again. Snip again, snip again, coming down. This corner, snip again, snip again. Now I have a nice open area. I can look inside. I can see the gills. So the gills aren't just superficial, they're very deep. And you can see how many sets of gills you have. If I go back here, you one, two, three, four, five. I didn't have to cut it open to figure that out. One, two, three, four, five. Five gills. Almost all sharks have five gills, except the seven gilled shark. Guess how many it has? For real, that's its name, seven gills. It's like you run out of names for sharks, so you just Pick something on that surface. Okay, so now we're open. This is not super, super easy because remember, we're actually cutting into the digestive tract, but we're exposing the respiratory tract at the same time. So as you're cutting here, you're gonna see the gills. You're gonna see all these little lines for the gills because as water flows over, it has to go in between all those lines. That's where blood flows, right? There's a hard structure right here you're gonna have to snip through. Can you see it? It almost looks like teeth. It's not. Okay. This is a gill filter. And what it does is as things go through that shouldn't go through, like if it eats a, another fish or something and it tries to go get stuck in its gills, it stops. It catches it and redirects it towards the, the stomach. Uh, that would be like you eating something and then getting, you know, eating pizza and you laugh and you get a piece of pizza crust stuck in your nose, right? You've, had, you've done it piece of apple, somebody tells you a joke at lunchtime, and pff, the apple's in your nose and you're embarrassed, do you pick it out? What do you do? You go get a napkin, blow it out, right? It's the same idea. They have a special filter here to keep things from getting into their quote unquote nose, their lungs, right? So we're gonna snip through that, boom. We're gonna cut right through the gills on the inside. We left the outside gills intact. Cut, cut, cut. So these are the internal gill structures. Here's the external gill structures. The internals are deep, externals are superficial. Okay, we're cutting, 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 cut. All right now I'm straight down. The second cut says make a transverse cut, which means across. I'm going to cut from this location that I stopped at. So the cranial proximal spot on the pectoral fin, and I'm going to cut straight across. If you want to cut in an arch, you can see it kind of has that arch design to separate the chest. So here's the pectoral region. Here's the pericardial region. And what do you think that means? It's a fancy word, pericardial. If you have a perimeter, it means something's going around, right? Cardial means it's going around the heart, pericardial. Right? So I just went ahead and cut that arch. And here's another reason that I love using the blunt scissors. We, in a lab, if you have a, a good surgeon, med students like to use scalpels. They love cutting things. I don't know what it is. They just, you give them a sharp object and they want to just cut everything. Love them, but it makes me crazy. A good surgeon rarely ever uses their scalpel. They'll make a cut just like we did across the surface. They go under with the scissors, but not to cut. They actually slide in. So you can wiggle under the skin if you want and open the scissors and pull away. Wiggle in, open the scissors, pull away. Open the scissors, pull away. This is called blunt dissection. And what you're doing is every organ in your body has a wrapper. You're just sliding into the wrapper, separating the wrapper and pulling back. It's like, I don't know if you guys eat food like I do, but I'm weird. I like taking my food apart as I'm eating it. So if I'm eating a, uh, it sounds stupid, but sometimes when I'm eating a bratwurst, I like to peel the wrapper off the bratwurst. I don't know why I do that. If I'm eating chicken, I like peeling each of the muscle groups off, even before I knew what I was doing. It was just a weird habit. 
right? When I eat an egg, I can't help but eat all the white and leave the yolk intact and then I eat the yolk. What's wrong with me? So here, I'm actually under the skin. If you did this all the way across the skin at some point, and I'm letting you, I'm letting you keep cutting because I know it's tough to cut, so I'm just burning a little time here. But now you can see I can slide all over under the skin. You can do the same thing with chicken. If you have a piece of chicken at home before your parents cook it or you cook it, if you slide under the skin, you can wobble your fingers back and forth. Kind of tight. I'll just keep doing it like this. Wobble your fingers back and forth. You can separate the skin off the chicken and a piece of cake. Back in the olden days, back before I was a kid, you could use shark skin to sand things before sandpaper. So they would use shark skin, they'd do what I was just doing, take it, and then they would smooth things off the shark skin because it has the fine teeth and it would polish. So things could be polished with shark, shark skin. So if I really wanted to, I could peel the skin off and look at the muscle tone now. I see you guys are still working on some stuff, so I'm gonna give me up more time. But now I can see the muscle underneath, just like if it were a piece of chicken. Remember what I started with? Explorer. You know? If this applies to a, a shark, next time you're working with chicken, just you know, in the kitchen, give it a shot. And do the same thing on this side. Now I can wiggle my fingers, wiggle, 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 underneath. If I wanted to, I could go all the way up the fin and I could remove the skin, well, pretty much all the way up. I can remove the skin off the fin and look at the muscle on the fins. I can take my finger all the way down. You can see my finger under the skin. And I could cut, peel the skin back and look at different muscle groups. Same thing with chicken, right? Okay, so I'm hoping now, even though I see people working that you're just messing with the skin. We're going in here, cut across. This would be the equivalent of the sternum on you, which is your breastbone, is what play people call it. Gotta get through that jaw. Okay, Oops, a little bit deeper. Okay. So now you can see into the pericardial cavity, right? You can see over here at the gills. If I pull back, I can see here's the oral cavity, mouth. So what would this thing be? What would this? The tongue, right? Remember the tongue is mostly cartilage. It's not like our tongue. It's more for smashing things, grabbing hold and pushing against the roof of the mouth. There are the gills. Water comes in, goes over the gills. You can see the fine teeth of the gills. Right. I'm in. I really want to open this thing up like a book. So I'm just going to snip across these gills. Snip, snip. And peel. Hopefully you don't have to talk a lot because this is where you could potentially splash it in your mouth. And this is why you have goggles and an apron on, right? So now I'm open, cross, Oops. squeezing a little bit. I can see a little bit of uh, stuff I probably don't want in the mouth of my shark. Probably vomited a little bit before he died. She, I'm sorry, I keep calling her, he, her or him. So you can see all that stuff that can come out. If you had a little time, you could just scrape it out. Oops, Boop. it's gone, Boop. Boop. it's gone. There we go. Nice. Clean, tongue, gills. You can see the vasculature. Ah, oh, let me see if I can get this a little bit closer. Better. See all the little blood vessels? Oh boy, it's still kind of blurry, but there are a bunch of little round holes, openings there. Those are blood vessels. So, if you look at the diagram, here you have a heart. Here you have the gills, here you have the gills. So what we did, are these are actually the left gills and the left gills. We open this up, so all of this group is the right gill set, five of them. Blood pumps out of the heart. A little closer. Blood comes out of the heart, goes up into an aorta. There are actually a couple aortas. It's a little different than humans. Goes down these little tiny blood vessels into the gills. They go into capillary beds, microscopic blood vessels. And then the water catches the oxygen, puts it in, brings the oxygenated blood over 
by the vertebra. So remember, what you're looking at here is right along the vertebra in the shark. So here you have an aorta coming out of the heart. Here you have an aorta that's after the gills. This aorta is on the front side of the shark, this side. So what's the term for the front side of the shark? Is it a dorsal or ventral? It's ventral. So we call this the ventral aorta, and we call this one the dorsal aorta. Sorry, my D is not perfect there. And it's just telling you the locations. The ventral aorta, this is what makes this heart a lot different than ours. A shark's heart is pumping what? Oxygen rich, rich or oxygen poor? Oxygen poor. There's barely any oxygen in the heart of the shark. It pumps the blood forcefully, it pumps it out to the gills, picks up oxygen, and then that same heartbeat allows the blood to move to the other organs in the body. That and the muscles squeezing when it swims and it breathing and pressing helps pump blood through the shark. You're the same way. We always think of our blood being pumped just by the heart, but when you exercise, your muscles squeeze. When you breathe, your lungs squeeze your heart and actually pump blood too. It's not just the heart. Totally different stem class talking about the circulation like that. All right, so now we have this open. You're gonna look for this little treat here not treat by eating it, please don't do that. Treat by a special cool experience, right? We've got the shark open, see that? This thing is a blood vessel, that's the heart. So this whole area is called the pericardium, the pericardial cavity. And this gets a little bit tricky. So it's actually an S-shaped heart, not like ours with four chambers. If you flip the page in your manual, we already talked about this, but in our lungs, air comes down, goes into the alveoli sacs. We hold it for a second. We pull it as much oxygen as we can out. We pump it out. Sharks constantly have to have flow going over. They don't hold that water on top of the gills. It's constantly has the flow. So they can either bring water into the spiracle, puff their cheeks, and then push it out the gills, or they have to constantly be swimming, one of the two. No lungs. You can see that blue in, in textbooks, you always see blue vessels as deoxygenated blood. You can see here's the heart, blue vessel on the ventral side, deoxygenated blood going up to the gills, and now the gills are nice and red. Lots of fresh oxygenated blood. Like I said, you can tell the fish is fresh depending on how, how bright red the gills are. That means it still has a lot of oxygen in its system. Oops, I skipped over. This talks about the heart. So there are a couple structures. You have something called a sinus, which means a gathering point for something, either air or mucus or um, blood in this situation. Venosis means it's a vein. Veins always go to the heart. So you're looking for a vessel that would go towards the heart that collects blood from other places. Then once it goes through the heart, it leads through an arteriosis. Arteries always leave the heart. Conus arteriosus tells you it's a cone-shaped structure that goes into a major blood vessel. So that's what we're going to look for, these. You have an atrium. You collect the blood going into the heart. You have an atrium. It goes into the ventricle, and that's the big part that squeezes and pushes the blood out. So our sinus venosus is right here below the heart. It's the vein bringing blood in. goes into an atrium. It's actually, like I said, more S-shaped. It's straight like that goes to the ventricle, the ventricle pushes, it's gonna be wedge shaped for the conus, and then the conus pushes the blood into the arteries, the aorta that we just talked about, the ventral aorta. Your heart's more like this. You have two pumps instead of one. You have one that pumps to the whole body, but you have one that specifically goes to the lungs, so that it pumps, pushes the lungs, blood sits, gets oxygen, and then it pushes again. This side's deoxygenated, going into the lungs, picking up oxygen in the capillaries, the little blood vessels brings it back into the left side of the heart, the powerful side of the heart, fresh oxygenated blood. This beats and pushes it down to the muscles. You have a closed circuit system, which means that all the blood vessels are connected and they never break. They should never break. If they break, that's a problem. Open circuit, like a frog I think has one, some fish, push into a big sack, blood squishes around and then comes around. Which organ is the spiky looking one? 
in here. Spike you again. I'm not sure which spiky one you're talking about. Spiky again. I don't know if you just type the chat again. Let's see. Spiky wiki one. Hmm. You nod when I'm close. Nod. Nope. Gone, you don't see it in mine? Nuts. Oh, we'll keep digging in. If you see it again, uh, let me know. It's white, spiky looking and white. Oh, you're probably talking about a piece of cartilage, like these things? Yeah? No. <laughs> so while I'm on that, there's part of the jaw. You can see that. And it's not like, like us. If you actually move, and I'll come back to that white spiky looking thing. If you move something underneath, like here's another example, here's another piece of jaw. This is the part that holds the teeth. It looks like jelly, but it's hard. If you move something behind it, it's translucent. You can see the shadow of the scissors moving back and forth. It feels hard as a rock. The only difference between that and our bone is the amount of calcium stored. So cartilage and bone actually looks somewhere under a, micro, under a microscope. All right, spiky and white in here. Is it up here? Closer to the chest? That would be the sternum. That would be a cartilage-like bone. Hmm. OK, I'll watch. In the meantime, let's follow the heart. So like underneath, you got the major vessels of the heart. Here's one. There's the heart. There's another one down here below. Boy, I really need to zoom in. I'm going to do something really gross and move my camera with my gross, nasty hand. Swoop. Okay. So it's the heart. Because you really need to find these vessels. Oh, uh, pull it back a little bit. Yeah, is that the bottom jaw? Hmm. This might be a mystery that we're going to have to look at later. Save that piece and we'll come back to it. All right, so we're gonna take the heart. You can see the big lump here that looks like a big pebble at your ventricle. I don't know if you can tell, but if you look really close, it looks like strings going across the surface of the heart. Those are actually coronary arteries. If somebody has a heart attack, it's those blood vessels that get clogged up. It doesn't matter how much blood you have inside the heart, if the blood vessels on the surface get clogged, your heart's not gonna work. So there's the ventricle, back here in the back. You can see the atrium back here and the sinus. So blood is actually coming from below the heart. You go down here, kind of hold it up. But you've got a couple blood vessels. Here's one over here, here's one over here. They're coming together and they're pooling in that sinus. They go over into the atria. The atria pushes them into the ventricle, and the ventricle pushes it out and up to the conus arteriosus, which is just the cone beginning, and then into the ventral um, aorta. Once it goes there, you can kind of follow by separating. Separating, just push, 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 push. And remember, right now, this is coming over. This is the left side because it was connected here. Kind of push, kind of push, I'm separating. I can see a vessel right there. I'm doing gross dissection. Blunt gross dissection. Oops, I just lost it. I ripped it. Nuts. Oh, you can see part of the vessel. So here's a vessel here. It comes over and comes to the gills. In the diagram, you can see it. Here's the heart. There's the ventricle. There's the conus. Kind of cone. Oops. Got I zoomed out. Heart. Ventricle, conus, kind of cone shape. There's your um, ventral aorta. And you can see these little tiny blood vessels going into the gills. If it's going at a structure, we call it an afferent, technically called afferent, but I stress the A. Afferent. So we call these the afferent branchial arteries because they're branching over. They go in to the gills and then they 
come back. So if you look at this pathway, this is cut, cut. They come up, afferent branches, they go into the gills, they go across the gills. They come through the efferent, so they exit the gills and they go to the other aorta. This is the dorsal aorta. And come up here, you have a couple branches that are going up to the brain to give the brain fresh blood. This is all oxygenated blood. The rest goes down through the abdomen like we're about to cut open. So the blood, remember, coming out of the heart is not full of oxygen. It goes over to the gills, picks it up, goes to the back by the vertebra, and it starts pumping it to all of the tissues everywhere in the body. The brain and eye are actually unique too because that little hole, the spiracle, actually has a pathway that pushes fresh water over the brain. The brain can pull oxygen out of the water without the blood, which is nice. So now let's cut its heart out. Should I have said that more gently? Let's delicately remove the heart. So we're gonna get underneath it. We're not just gonna cut the heart itself. We're gonna remove as much vessel as we can. We're under it, we're getting the artery. You see some branches coming off, so I'm gonna try and get as many branches as I can. Clip, 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 clip. There we go. Right, I separated the artery. You can see the different branches coming out of the top. Now I want to go to the vein. Vein's going to be a little more broad because there are a couple of veins coming in. So I'm going to start over on one side, move my heart. Oops, out of the way. I'm going to go underneath it so I know where I am. There we go. And then I'm going to clip way down here, clip way down there. I know, I do way too many sound effects. I say clip too often if I clip more than one time. It's my fault. Way down here, there we go. Whole heart, boom. Just sometimes for me, it's hard to imagine this entire fish stays alive because of that little muscle. So we can see the vasculature coming in. There's the venous structure, the sinus, coming in, comes up into the atria, the top chamber of the heart, goes down to the ventricle, comes over to the conus, and out. So I like to look inside things. I don't know about you. I'm going to slide into, actually I have to cut these open a little bit more, just so I can get my scissors in. Okay, open, I'm going to wiggle. Now I'm going into the aorta. I'm gonna put that over. Ooh, I can feel blood clots in there. A little resistance. So I'm sliding it in, just the tube, right? And then, snip. It's open. I'm gonna wiggle into the ventricle. There you can see those little tiny lines, the little hair-like lines, right above my thumb, coronary arteries. Snip, snip. I open it up. Ooh, I snip far enough down. And snip. Okay. And anytime you want to put this on the pad and pin it down so you can see inside, you can. So you can kind of see it's not a perfectly hollow chamber. You see the hollow spot right here at the tip. All these little lines, oh man, I really wish that my camera would focus on this, but it's not. So all those little, it looks like webbing of muscle. Those are trabeculae. There's a valve in there, which is too small to actually point out. The blood comes from back there from the atria, comes up and around to the ventricle, comes shooting out the aorta, squirt, deoxygenate it low oxygen blood. And I'm going to set this heart right here to the side. And just for the sake of time, if you want to measure your heart, you can. I'm not. But I'm going to get through the dissection part and then you can feel free to keep dissecting even without me. You don't have to uh, stop playing just because I am done. And the same thing, if we run it and end up running out of time, you can go if you need to. We're, re we're recording this and we're going to post it online. So if you wanted to come back and do it later, you probably won't have the fish or the shark, but you could always buy a fish in a fish market or something. 
Okay. So now we want to check out the digestive tract. We cut the heart out. We looked at that. We looked at respiratory tract. We opened the mouth. Oops. Let's go back again. Ah. We opened the mouth. This. You see the roof of the mouth. Remember, taste buds are up there. It's very firm. Just like the roof of your mouth, you can feel it. it has the little grippy lines so that when something goes in, it kind of helps it from going backwards. It's got the rows of teeth to prevent things from going backwards. Now we're going to cut straight through. So a shark is a carnivore. Furs meat. A uh, cat is an obligate carnivore. Cats only want to eat meat. If they're eating grass and stuff, it's usually because they have an upset tummy or they're sick. So we're going to cut. Okay. You already felt the mouth. Uh oh, where'd it go? There it is. We're going to cut straight down the center, dot a line. Don't pay attention to this. We're going to cut all the way down. You're going to cut all the way to the cloaca. Remember, that's between the two pelvic fins. So we're getting under there. This is where the diaphragm would be in a human. Your lungs would be up here. This is actually separated by a sac, so you have to puncture that sac. Looks like I already punctured it a little bit. But there's a protective sac that separates the abdomen, all of its organs from the pericardial area. So I'm gonna clip, snap, just like cutting a human sternum actually. Same kind of snap. Uh, we're a little bit harder. All right, here's the big thing. Remember, pointy scissors, don't stab anything in there. I'm in, I can feel, I can stick my finger and I know I'm in. I'm just gonna hook the scissors under and pull the skin up, snip, and muscle. I'm gonna hook it under, pull up, and cut. I don't wanna cut anything I don't have to. Anybody remember the S word for the name of the cut we're making since it goes right down the midline? It's called a sagittal cut. So you're cutting all the way down, all the way down. It's gonna get a little bit tighter right here because remember, this is the hip-like structure. Just like you, your hips connect in the middle. We have a little piece of cartilage called the pubic symphysis. Some people call it the pubic bone. It's gonna be cartilage in the fish too. So it's gonna to take a little bit of a snap. Snap, hear it? Right to the cloaca and I stop. Here's the cloaca, I stopped right there. So now you have a sagittal, it's called mid sagittal, right down the middle, all the way down. You're gonna come back up, we're gonna make it book like. Remember that dotted line? The last line we cut was from the cranial proximal over to the cranial proximal. We're gonna do the same thing, except we're gonna do the caudal, the back part of the uh, pectoral fin. So from here, across here, and of course you're not gonna stab in there, you're just gonna aim. I'm gonna go just like this, not cutting any internal organs, but I cut right underneath the fin, come back this way, cutting right under the fin to the armpit. All right, now that's open, that's open. There's a lot of muscle trying to pull this together. The last cuts, I'm gonna go all the way down here, right above the cloaca, and I'm gonna cut. Now, careful because here, what fin do you have here? Pectoral fin and pelvic fins. I don't wanna cut the actual um, cartilage skeleton here. I wanna try and aim for it above it so I can feel there's where the proximal part is. I'm gonna put my finger there because I don't wanna cut my finger and I'm pretty good at not cutting myself. And I snipped. Boom. I'm gonna do the same thing over here. I feel the top of my thumb. I aim. Boom. Snip. Oops, that was not perfect. There we go. This one, I think I'm gonna cut just a little bit more of the lateral side. Now we have it right where we want it. Am I going anywhere? If I were you, and this is my recommendation because I'm about to do it, I would grab four pins. There's one. Take a pen, angle it, it's a trick. Angle it so it's going at about 45 degrees down towards the shark, but I'm gonna go out here, I'm gonna go down. Remember, 90 degrees is going straight up and down. That will work kind of, but if you put any pressure on it, it'll snap it out. If you go this way, the skin's just gonna come right back together. So I take it, I pull the skin, and I push it at an angle going that way. I grab another pen, go to the opposite side, and I do exactly the opposite. I put an 
pin in here with the angle going back towards the fish, shark, and it holds it, boom. Now the tension on these two sides hold the skin open. Perfect. I grab two more of my six. I'm gonna do the same thing up here. Take this one, put it in. Goes back, center it a little bit, and push that in. Boom. Got to make sure that uh, my logos are here. In fact, I'll move that up a little bit. Got to keep the sponsors happy, right? So we can keep getting you the STEM kits real cheap, like. Man, it blows my mind. So there's not a lot of money in the school system, and then some companies charge like 60 to 80 bucks to do a dissection of something like this when they sell it to schools, and I just Wow, we managed to put this whole thing together for 30 bucks. Okay, and the kids don't even get to take the tools home. All right, we're all open. Hopefully everybody's with me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shrink down the chat so I can kind of look and see where you're all at. If you're still cutting, like stick your hand up. No, no. Nice elbow itch, I was kind of wondering there. Nope, nope, nope. Looks like we're all good. Cool. That was my son's first word, cool. I'm not joking. Um, all right, look how oily it is, it's so oily. If you've ever opened up a can of sardines and not oil, yeah, look at it all. That's inside. The benefit of the oil, do you remember? Sharks don't have a swim bladder, so they don't have the air pocket for buoyancy. They depend on a lot of this oil for a couple things, help to float and also for temperature control because oil, um, if you have heat internally, the oil is like a layer of blubber that keeps the heat inside. So a lot of water animals like seals have a lot of blubber around the outside to, to keep their internal temperature where it's supposed to be. Okay. So here we are. First thing you'll move, you got this real long thing that looks like a fish in there, just pull it back. Whoop. This real long thing here on the opposite side looks just like it, so it's twin. Pull it back. Whoop. Now it looks like it has two sets of arms and a cape, right? Going out on the town. This organ is one organ, but it has three lobes. So here's one on its left. Here's one on its right, it's the liver. Where's the third one? Right here in the middle. Third lobe. So we cleverly called this the right lobe, the left lobe, and the middle lobe, right? Anatomy is pretty tricky. On this middle lobe, you're gonna see this green thing. It's actually a sac it's called the gallbladder. So the gallbladder is important because when you eat food, there are three main things you're trying to get from food. Protein, carbohydrate, proteins, so like amino acids, proteins, carbohydrates, which are sugars, um, and then the last thing is fats, right? triglycerides is fats. This gallbladder helps you break down fat so you can absorb them. If you eat something that's fatty and your gallbladder is not working properly, that fatty stuff doesn't get broken down, and what you don't break down in your GI tract will come out the other end the way it went in. So, can you live without a gallbladder? Yeah, you can actually, because this greenish yellow stuff is called bile. Bile is the chemical that breaks down fats. Bile is like Dawn dish soap in your kitchen. If you take a pan of hamburger grease and you put it in water, the grease floats to the top in those nasty blobby bubbles. If you put Dawn in there and mix it around, the bubbles disappear. They didn't go anywhere actually, they just spread out. If you stick your hand down in the water and you pull it back out, all those bubbles will cling to the surface of your hand. That's what bile does. It takes big globs of fat and breaks them into microscopic ones so that your body can absorb them. It's kind of a cool process, but that works just like Dawn. Um, if you take bile and you put it on fat and you rub it like this, it actually foams up like dish soap too. It's kind of cool, gross. All right, 
So that's vial. There's a little string that hangs off the gallbladder, comes all the way down. It's called the bile duct. And if you follow it, don't rip anything, but you can kind of pull things apart a little bit. Oh man, I think I had the jackpot. I feel something in its stomach. Stomach. Sorry, I got sidetracked. Um, if you follow this down, it will actually lead down into the intestine right here. You see it going down, down, down into the intestine. Because when you start absorbing food, you swallow food and you break it down in your stomach. Ooh, I got cut on my gloves. You break it down in your stomach, but you don't absorb any nutrients in your stomach. It, if any of ever said you absorb things in your tummy, they're totally wrong. It's not your stomach. You have to turn food into baby food, mush. So when you chew food, that's the first step. You introduce it to saliva and, and enzymes. You get it in your stomach, and then you dump stomach acid and other enzymes on it to turn it into mush. And what we'll probably find is something in there that was once you know, alive that's now turning into baby food mush. Once your food's the consistency of baby food in your stomach, then it moves down through the stomach and into the small intestine to be this thing. The small intestine is actually where you start absorbing nutrients. You don't absorb anything in your stomach, right? So to absorb these fats, the bile comes down here, dumps on the fat, breaks it apart, and then you suck all the fat into your blood through your intestine. So it's a lot more complex, but that's the gist of it. Almost all the nutrients you absorb are gonna be in the first 12 inches of your 25 foot intestines. So it's crazy, we have all this intestine, but almost all of the work happens in the first 12 inches like bile. Another organ's right here. I don't know if you can really see it. It looks the same color, but you see right along here, it looks like it's, here's your stomach, comes around. See that fine line? Stomach is back here. Here's a small intestine. This kind of tannish colored organ is your pancreas. There's another branch of the pancreas back here. There it is. Right there. It's kind of like a leech. So in you, you have one pancreas. This is still, I think, technically one pancreas, but you have a head of a pancreas and the tail of the pancreas that sits under your stomach. Shark's the same way. Shark has to be able to, to process carbohydrates, which are sugars and um, proteins into amino acids, just like you do, and that's what the pancreas helps do. This makes enzymes that go into the small intestine right here at the same spot, so where the bile comes in, on the backside, the pancreas has a, a tube that goes in the same place. And they both squirt at the same time, break down fats, proteins, and sugars. Anybody else know what the pancreas does? It actually has something that's nothing related to your GI tract. So it can release a hormone, actually releases a lot of hormones, but one really important hormone in our society today that controls one disease or disorder that that does a lot of damage to people. So insulin is made in the pancreas. It's released into the bloodstream to help you regulate blood sugar. That's when it pushes stuff into the blood. Enzymes push into the GI tract. Right? So there's your pancreas. This guy right here, triangular, the spleen. As a baby, your spleen helps you make blood, red blood cells. As an adult, not so much. Actually, not at all but it does break down red blood cells because your red blood cells in your blood can't heal. Once they're made, they live for about 120 days, so four months, and then the spleen and the liver actually destroy them. But white blood cells for your immune system hang out in here too, so when the blood comes running through, it can attack it. So here's a cool thing to think about. You have a liver, you have a spleen, just like a, a shark. Look at the proportion of this. If you look at the picture in your book, your liver, compared to the rest of the intestines is not that big. It's the most dense organ in your whole body, the heaviest by weight, typically. But the sharks is the same size up here. It just hangs down because your liver doesn't just make bile to store in the gallbladder. It also detoxifies your blood. Anything from your GI tract goes to your liver first. So if you take aspirin or Tylenol or um, antibiotics or any kind of a drug, your body doesn't want drugs. Otherwise, it would make it. When the drugs go in, it goes to the liver first, and the liver tries to pull out as much of the drugs to clean up the drugs or to remove any of the chemicals that shouldn't be in your system right away. It's like a filter, but it also stores sugar. It stores amino acids. It helps regulate your blood sugar when you're sleeping. The liver actually has tons and tons of functions 
but it's primarily as a filter. So when you look at a shark, why do you think a shark out in the middle of the ocean eating every kind of thing that's in the ocean that moves would need such a big liver? I'll give you a hint. Pigs have enormous livers. Rats have enormous livers for their body size. Cats have big livers because all of those things like to eat trash. So you need a big liver to process the trash you eat, to clean up anything that could get into your system. We're pretty refined, humans are. We've evolved our livers to be for cooked meats that we kill most of the bacteria or viruses or whatever. So our livers don't have to be the way they used to be. Unfortunately, we do a lot of other bad things to our livers. Um, like alcohol, your liver has to process that. That's the reason that people that are, uh, drink too much alcohol have liver damage or get liver damage from it, right? There's the liver, bile, spleen, sorry, gallbladder with bile, spleen. You can see that that bile seeps out and leaves greenness in other places. Pancreas, right? Let's check out what's inside the stomach. All right, so we're swallowing a fish. You're a shark. Go. Here's the stomach. The stomach actually goes all the way down here and you can feel this, it's like muscular. That's the end of the stomach. So it comes down, goes in a J shape and ends right here. This muscle is called a sphincter and a sphincter is a round muscle that goes around a tube and holds it so nothing goes past like a valve. When your baby food consistency food is ready to move that opens up and squirts a little bit in, your intestine stops. When your intestine moves that along, it opens up, squirts a little more and it stops. It allows your digestive tract to go one section at a time. So you swallow this big fish. I'm so excited. I'm psyched because I actually think there's more than one fish in here. I am so excited. Is that bad? So weird. Anywho, so we're going to cut down. Opening the jaw a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. You're going to have to cut probably a little bit of liver. Maybe not. You could probably slide underneath it. I try to preserve everything I can because I like to see where structures are located. All right. And here's where it's going to get gross. Take your finger and act like you're going to choke the shark. You're sticking your finger back in there. Oh, man. Ooh. So here's another fun fact. A shark can actually turn its stomach partially inside out if it wants to vomit. Here's some of the esophagus actually right here. You see all these little bumps? I can't get my finger in there. You should probably be able to slide in, but this one had a big meal before it died. Those little bumps there are called papillae, and they go all the way down the esophagus leading to the stomach. The papillae, you don't have the papillae in yours. Well, you have something like it, um, but when you swallow with your esophagus, it's actually about a seven second trip. So when you swallow, you go one, two, three, four, five, six, bloop, seven, drops into your stomach. Sharks just open up, swallow, close. If anything tries to go backwards, the papillae help grip it to hold on to it. Right? So we're gonna try and figure out where the other side of the esophagus is. And that's what I'm working on here. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. This is my female. So this is actually where the ovary and uterus are at. And it feels like there's something in there. Huh, we'll get there. I got sidetracked again. So we're going to follow the esophagus. You can see those papillae. I'm going to try and cut around it so I don't damage anything I don't need to damage. All right. Well, I'm going to be perfect. Here's more esophagus. If you need to jump somewhere that you can't poke, just pinch it. Pinch it and then cut like that. Boom. Cut right into it. Now you see the hole. I can get into the esophagus. I'm going to cut it a little bit. Cut a little bit. Cut a little bit. Now I can see all inside the esophagus on this side. You can see the papilla again. Please tell me you're touching these. These are so cool. It's like a sea urchin or something in there. So I'm opening it up. I'm going to cut straight down. So the esophagus is just going to turn into the stomach. Snip. Still see the papilla, so I'm in esophagus. Snip. Papilla are gone. See the difference? Here's the papilla. Here it changes. Now it's something different. I'm gonna cut, 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 cut. I'm just snipping them straight down. Oh yeah. Woo! Look at that fish. 
my fifth story. Sorry, I was showing the person that's watching over me. So there's, there's part of dinner. Oh, jackpot, two of them. There's the other part of dinner. It's a bluegill. Look. Wow, that almost makes me feel like it was local. That's weird, so strange. How many people got something on the inside? Cheerios? Yeah, I was expecting Cheerios or Fruit Loops, but no, I was totally off. Holy moly, that one's bigger than my fish. Oh, yeah, but I think I get like quantity. What do we have here? Oh man, this thing eats better than I do at night. Look at that shrimp, very nice. So fish dinner and shrimp. Red lobster, this is what, 26, 27 bucks? So your shark just paid for itself if you got the, the dinner, right? So here's something mine's missing that yours will probably have if you didn't have a big meal. Mine stretched the stomach as far as it possibly can. When you're in the stomach, you should see lines, folds. You can see it kind of right here. See that fold? Yours should be, if you didn't have a big meal fed fish, you should have lots of those folds all over. So what happens, those are called rugae. You have them too. And they allow your stomach to get really small down to where your stomach would only hold a couple tablespoons full of fluid all the way open and it would stretch. So the rugae are gone to hold about a liter and a half. That's how big most people can stretch their stomach. If you eat a lot all the time, you can just keep stretching. And that's why people that eat a lot, a lot of times it's hard for them to go on a diet because they're Stomach always, it's like, hey, you know, this is too small. I need something in there. But the rugae, mine stayed stretched because it died and the preservatives kept it stretched. Otherwise, it's elastic. You can stretch it like a rubber band in and out. If yours have all the lines and you pull on it, you're not going to be able to straighten it out because proteins in your body are like albumin. And albumin is the clear part of an egg. If, you, if you're cooking eggs, you crack the clear part open, you dump it into the pan and it turns white, your blood and your proteins actually are packed with albumin. So it's little clear proteins that are clear. But when you cook them or you change them, they actually turn white. They denature is the technical term you probably heard. So if you cook an egg with heat, it denatures it. But if you cook an egg with chemicals, it also denatures it. So if I put acid, like formaldehyde, like formaldehyde, in here, it denatures and changes the protein, so now they're firm. They're not stretchy anymore. It's like an egg. You can't make an egg go from the white back to the clear. All right, let's keep going. Oops, my chat, uh, chat spot shut off. Let me see if I can get that back. I want to make sure that if you, anybody has a question that somebody can ask it. Hopefully, you're having a lot of fun. I know the beginning's kind of slow because it's a lot of education. like. We call it didactic. That means when the teacher tells you way too much without showing you anything. So here we go. All right, so now the sound comes down. Remember, it comes in a J curve. It's gonna come up this way. We don't have to cut it open. We can just follow it along. There's that muscle. If you wanna cut the muscle, you can. It's called the pyloric sphincter. Ooh, gross. There's a little of that baby food consistency from whatever it just ate. It's like a pimple almost, right? Nasty. So that's what you have to turn fish into that when you when you digest it too. All right, comes around the corner. Like I said, everywhere in your body has a sac. Your brain has the meninges that wraps it and protects it. Inside the abdomen, you have the peritoneum that wraps and protects it, and it's actually stuck to the wall here. But if I pull it like this, see, there's a sac called the mesentery that actually comes up and over and wraps this too. And I can see that when I was coming along here and I put my finger under the pancreas, you can see there's the sac. Every muscle in your body has that sac. When you eat a chicken and you separate the chicken leg, each of the muscle groups, you can separate it because each of them have these sacs. Every organ has its own sac. The heart has a sac called the pericardium. Your lungs have a sac called the, the pleural sac. If you rupture your pleural sac, you get a collapsed lung. 
So it's protective. They're all protective. And a sur if you're working with a surgeon, um, that's why they don't use a scalpel a lot because you have these protective sacs and they can just pull the sacs apart, do their surgery, let go of it, maybe put one stitch in there, pull away, and your body will heal those sacs back into their proper place. It's really, a, it's important not to make a lot of unnatural cuts in the body. Okay, we're coming around the corner, the J, now we're into the intestine. There you can see there's the, um, the bio line. You can underneath see if I can separate it clearly. Uh, it's not super clear where it's going. But... Right. So now we're going to go down. So I've got my finger under the pancreas. I was looking to see if you can see the pancreatic duct. So the bile duct comes off the gallbladder to cure bile. Pancreatic duct comes off the pancreas to release enzymes. It's not super apparent, but you can see now there's that long tail part of the pancreas and it comes up and it actually connects with that head. Yours and your body does, isn't separate like that. It's, still, it's like a tadpole, has a fat head and long tail. All right, so let's just do this. This long thing here is intestine. Okay. Technically, this will be the small intestine. See how it has lines like the back of a, like a wasp? It's called the spiral intestine because these lines don't go perfectly transverse. They actually go diagonal, and it's a spiral, a coil on the inside. So let's check it out. Snip. Just, I pinched it, cut it, and now I'm in. Oof. This was a happy shark when it passed. All right. So now I'm in. I'm just going to cut right along so I can open it up like a book again. This is a little bit trickier because, remember, it's a spiral. It's not just a hollow tube straight up and down. It actually coils. So when I go to separate it, like this, man, yeah, it was definitely a full fish. Just leftovers of some other <laughs> fish in there. Maybe it's part of this one. But you can see all these, these are, they don't look like it, but these are actually all filled with blood vessels. The blood vessels pick up nutrients, carry it off to the rest of the system. The reason that this isn't just one straight tube is because the only way you can get the nutrients out of your food is the nutrient to touch the wall of the intestine, then get pulled into the blood. But if you have a wad of food, the stuff in the middle never gets touched. So by having the spiral system, it takes little amounts and pushes against these thin walls and you increase surface area. So instead of this being, you know, like six inches long and the outside is like four inches wide, so that's 24 square inches, it's not the reality. I have all of these folds. So instead of 24 square inches, I probably actually have closer to 24 square feet of surface area to absorb nutrients. You are the same way. So your intestines don't have the spiral. We have something called circular um, filet, and they go in transverse sections around, but it's the same idea. Your food goes over a flap and it catches in, over a flap and catches in, and it's constantly getting the nutrients taken out in the small intestine. And then finally into the colon, your colon, large intestine, will come over to a side, you have an appendix, you come all the way up, almost to the chest, under the diaphragm, over to your left side, and then all the way back down, and then you go into the rectum, which is the last part of the, the large intestine, um, where you defecate or release feces from. But on the fish, not that much time, because really the fish is it's pooing all the time. It just drops poo everywhere it goes. As it fills up the rectum, just dumps it out. It doesn't need to pull back water like we do. We're land animals. We need to pull water out of our feces to make it more dense. They don't need that. Um, if you see these little circles in here, there you can see blood vessels. I don't know if you can see the little circles. Little circle, little circle there, circle there. Those are blood vessels. They go into capillaries that you can't see. Okay, moving down. There's another little structure. This is really weird. You don't have one of these. This is called a rectal gland. It's considered technically part of the digestive system, but it takes, sharks live in salt water. Salt water is not good for you to be drinking. And so sharks have a special gland that cleans out the excess salt from their body, puts it in this gland and excretes it out right into the cloaca. That's the GI tract. 
pretty stinking amazing. I'm so excited. Can't believe we got a shrimp. Huh. Mind blown. Nice. We got spleen, rectal gland. All right. If you have, so this is where um, reproduction comes back in. If you have a boy, it's going to be a little different than a girl. So you see this tube? There's a tube here. It looks like it's just a fold, but it's actually a tube. It goes all the way up like this. On the other side, I have the same tube. It goes all the way up. It goes, and if I were to move this out of the way, see, it just keeps going all the way up. So this would be the uterine tube. There we go. It's going all the way up. Uh, in humans, we would call it a fallopian tube. So if we follow this, it's in the female reproductive. And this, all this stuff up here, oof, falling, kind of falling apart. Ovary. So if you have a male, you'll have this tube, but if you kind of flatten the tube out, it's pretty cool because you'll see a tube within a tube that coils the whole way up, it coils. And then up here, instead of a, an ovary, because really male and females until about five weeks of development in humans, your ovary and your, or your testis are just called the sex gonad. Uh, it's not actually differentiated as a male or a female yet until five weeks when, when your chromosome tells it, hey, now you're gonna be a boy, so we can turn into something else. Same idea. So in a shark, up here you'll either find the testis that makes sperm or you'll find the ovary that makes eggs. And I thought, wow, it's so dense. Actually, I still might. It may have been making eggs. Uh, I don't feel, it's almost like that's a yolk sac for a baby, but I don't feel a body anywhere. So maybe it was just starting to get pregnant. And then of course, on the other side, you'll have another one right here. Oh, it was, it was making eggs. Here are a couple. That's pretty awesome. I'm going to push this back out of the way. So the things that are the same shape, they would be the testis in the male, and then this spermatic cord going all the way down would deliver the sperm. And here's your uterus. Boom. So when fertilized, you can start developing the babies in here, and they'll keep growing, just like we talked about with the babies growing and developing in there. They can either be released as eggs, they can grow and hatches an egg inside and stay protected until they're released, or they can grow as just like a human baby and be released. If you keep looking, so right down the middle, there's a tube. There are two blood vessels that go right down the middle. On either side, right underneath this string, right underneath this string, there's a dark line. You can kind of open your scissors and scrape a little bit. And it's a thin, it's not like us. Our kidneys are, are bean shaped. They're like shaped like a kidney bean. But this dark line that goes up under here is actually a flat kidney that goes the length of the abdomen. So they have kidneys that make urine like us, except they're flat along the back. Wow, so crazy. This was such a good one. So colon goes to the cloaca here. You have the uterine tube to the uterus to deliver babies out to cloaca or receive sperm from the male. You've got the ovaries up here with developing eggs. You've got the liver, gallbladder, stomach, intestine, spiral intestine. Those are the spiral sections. Ours have circular pila in them. Rugae were the lining here. Papilla up in the esophagus. And that's really your whole GI tract. Anywhere that you see dark stringy lines, along this line here. It's deep, you can kind of see it. So where the muscles separate, you can see the lines of the muscles and everything, but that's a blood vessel. That's a lateral vessel because it sits on the outside edge. The dorsal vessels would be back here and the ventral vessels would be right up at the front where we cut. I think we've covered most of everything that's inside. Gallbladder, 
If you look in here, you can go back and label. And a lot of these are simple to find. I could probably make a key input on a line for you. But you can see like the spiral intestine. Oh, I shouldn't say it. Blah, 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 blah. But some super simple ones, like this is the rostrum, not the nose. So you can guess what these are. You can label them, kind of fun. Okay. And then the last thing I want to do is remove the brain and an eyeball. We're actually running over by, what are we running over? Or are we not running over? What time is it? Oh, bad day to forget my watch. Wouldn't matter if I touch my watch, I never want to use it again, ever in my life. 2.30? I think we have until 3.30. Now we have plenty of time. What am I talking about? I'm crazy. Awesome. There we go. Anybody have any questions about the GI tract while we're in there? And I have not forgotten about the spiky white thing. We can always go back to it. Let's look a little bit of the muscle and start the nervous system. I'm gonna put my fish up by the heart. Catch of the day. I'm very proud. Okay. I'm pulling a pin out and putting it up here in the pad so I know where it's at. One, two of them. Up here. I'm going to tilt this up. Hopefully, you can see it. Everybody got the cut across here. I'm hoping it focuses on my hand and we can see that. Yeah, I see that nasty rip in my glove too. And my hand's going to smell like fish for three or four days now. That's a little bit better. Oh, it's 3 30. Nuts. All right. Well, that thing right there. Thank you for. Reminding me this clock is off and military time. That round thing right there is the vertebral body. What's cool about this is that in a shark, you can cut it, put it under a microscope and count the rings just like a tree and find out how old your shark is. Crazy. There's a little vessel here and a little vessel under it that's kind of collapsed, but that big one that's open is an artery for high pressure blood. The one underneath it is actually a vein, it's a little pressure and they collapse easy. There's another spot right there above and that's the spinal cord. It's hard to see. You took a pen, super soft. Spinal cord is, and brain are both really soft. It would just slide right in like that. You don't have to put much pressure, it slides in. Oop. So you, if you need to go, you can. Oops, I gotta take these other pens out. Three, four. I'm just gonna make a cut on the back, cut the spine the eye, and I probably won't do the brain. I'll let you do it if you want to, but if you need to go, that's fine. This is recorded, you can play with it later. If you have a fish for dinner, you can ask not to cook it and cut it instead. All right, so to get in, you wanna feel the neck. You can use either, if you wanna use sharp scissors, you can. I'm still just a big fan of the blunt tipped ones because I have more control with them. So. There's the meaty part of the back of the neck. You can feel it. You'll know. Here are the spiracles. Put your fingers there and pinch. You can feel the bone slide down. You can feel it drop from the back of the skull, like in the picture. Here's where you're pinching by the spiracles, and you drop down. You can feel your fingers drop into the neck. Pinch, spiracles, drop into the neck. I'm going to pinch this side. Either side doesn't matter. And I'm going to cut. Straight across, I'm going to pinch this side and cut. I'm doing a lot of abuse to my dual scissors, so I'm going to use these. So I'm in. I've made two cuts and I can bend this, and now I can see the muscle that goes along the back. I'm just going to go a little bit lower and snip, a little over to the right, go back to the left. I'm just taking small bites one at a time. Right. Actually, I still prefer these. Clip. 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 Now, if I bend forward, I can see the vertebra. I've cut all the muscle, and I can see kind of a whitish, clear vertebra right there. I have tap on it; I can feel it. Soft to this side, little soft to this side, hard right there. So now I'm going to take the cut that goes right across the neck. Cut. Now I've severed spinal cord. I cut. 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 Cut.
cut a little bit down on the sides again. Oops, a little splatter, a lot of juice. There it is. And you can see it again. Okay. You can see from this side better. There's the nice round vertebral body right here. This white, this is calcium. This is a cartilage, not as much calcium, still firm. And if you look in the, the book, here you have the neural arch, kind of triangular in shape. Right in the middle of that arch, there it is, spinal cord. This is what I think is kind of cool. Watch this. So you don't have to do this. I just want to show you a cool trick. I'm going to cut a little bit lower. Oops. Right through the spinal cord. Just going to make sure it cut through because this takes a little bit of time. So I'm just going to try and do it quickly. There we go. Now, I actually cut through the spinal cord back there and up here. Hope this works. Oh. oh no, I'm hard time getting it. It's so soft. When I was a kid, my mom always kept a can of Crisco grease on the back of the stove and I was always curious. I stuck my finger in it. And the first time that I did a neurosurgery on an animal, I wasn't supposed to, but I did it anyway. I took my glove off and I touched it. It didn't, because I was scrubbed in and it didn't actually affect the animal tissue. Yeah, I'm having a hard time. But I touched the spinal cord with my finger. And then later I touched the brain. And it was just like that Crisco grease. My finger just squished onto it. It's gross. But cool. All right. May not be able to get it. But normally, if I had a little more time and a little bit better tweezers, I could pull this. Oh, I feel it coming. I could pull the spinal cord out. And it would look like a long worm. I'd be able to do the same with over here. But we're gonna cut down. So we're gonna to get to an eyeball. Pick an eyeball, left or right, it's up to you. And I'm gonna go right here along where the gills are, so I can see that pocket. There's less to cut. I'm gonna snip, 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 whoops, snip. Oops, I, so if you saw, I pushed this in and the eyeball moved. That means I wanna go closer to the surface so I don't cut the eyeball. Snip, snip. Now, expose this. And you can take your fingers and just kind of split like you're opening up a crab. It's protective covering. The eye on a shark has an eyelid, which is also pretty unique. It has a, um, a covered eyelid, so it can close it and block the light. And it usually only uses, it doesn't use it like we do to push fluids across. It only uses it when there's something close to its face and it's about to attack. Typically, it closes its eye and just goes in so that that other thing doesn't hurt its eye. Sharks actually have really good vision. Whoops. So if you were looking at the eye, here's what we're going down to. There are some muscles around it. And you can see this is the orbit. So orbital sockets where the eye sits. We'll see some nerves and things going in there too. As I pull back, if you see these little white stringy things, those are all different nerves. This one goes over towards the ear, uh, auditory. And going down here, I want to cut up a little bit around the eye without cutting the eye. So you can see that protective covering again around the eye. Oops, sorry. I'm just going to try and stay on the skin side of it. I'll cut. I'll cut. And cut. Should be able to peel that back again. So the chondrocranium is a 
cartilage skull. Makes it nice when you're cutting it with scissors instead of having to drill it. When we're in the lab and we have to drill into a skull, you don't just cut it with a pair of scissors, you have to have a special tool, a special drill. So what I just did, I keep getting out of view, sorry. I just slid underneath the skin across the top of the head and I opened the scissors from the inside. That just allowed me access to the skull. Still kind of tight across the top of the head. I'm gonna go in here, separate. I'm gonna go in and separate. Separate again. And I push my finger in. Now you can see most of the skull. And I'm not going to go any in any more detail, but you can see there's the round orbital structures. The brain's a nice straight line. You can see a brain in the in the manual. I just want to get you exposed to the back of the eye. So you see all of the skull socket. You see it's still clear. It's not hard bone. It's still clear. And then I'm just running this over the eye, trying not to damage anything. Just kind of freeing things up, freeing it up, freeing it up. There we go. I'm going to cut way up here by the rostrum. Use your tweezers if you want. I'm just using my fingers most of the time. I, I like dissecting with my fingers because I can feel what I'm doing. I know when something gives. And then, there we go. Now exposing. Okay. I'm going to pull this down. Now you start seeing things like the muscles. There's a little strip right here, there's a muscle. You can see there's six muscles that control the eye. One that goes medially, so it turns the eye towards the nose. One that goes laterally, it turns the opposite. One that goes inferior, points down. One that pulls it up, superior. So you can move those directions. If you need to move it diagonally, you just fire these two muscles and pull it over. You have two extra ones. There's one here and one down here that actually turn. They're oblique because they go at an angle and they twist the eye, kind of spin it a little bit. If you don't feel that spinning. You don't necessarily um, get the experience visually of it spinning. It's just like when you're falling sideways, you get a little bit of adjustment so you don't get dizzy. That's what we're looking at. We're looking at these muscles. There's a muscle here. You can see it's kind of pink. Muscle down there, kind of pink. Another muscle right there, kind of pink. And then what we're really looking for is one that's not pink anymore. It's actually white, and that's because it's not a muscle. It's the optic nerve. So the nerve sends signals from the eye, the brain, tell what's going on. I'm just going to go ahead and do the time. There it is. I can see it right there between my tweezers. It's white. I accidentally ripped it a little bit. So I may as well just take the whole eyeball out. Oops, a little bit of pull. Well, you can definitely see the muscle. Oops, I've just ripped the muscle. See how I ripped that muscle right there? There was one. Here's one. Went right along, in case you couldn't see it before. So I'll just snip around, free it up. And vision is so incredible. We put so much faith in our vision and so is our body. That's why visual illusions are so cool. Here you can see where that eyelid on the underside comes up. So there's the eyelid coming over. Um, it's because things lie to us all the time and our vision makes it believable. 
when people pick pockets and stuff like that, it neglects all the other sensations for vision. Let me see a visual illusion. There are visual illusions out there, sound and sight, where someone's saying one word, but you're seeing another and your mind makes up a word in between. Pretty crazy. It's called the McGurk effect, if you get a chance to look it up. Right? The optic nerve right there. So you can see all these pinkish colored muscles. There's a muscle, there's a muscle, there's a muscle, muscle, lots of muscles, and then optic nerve, little white nerve there. There's the front of the eye. When the light goes through the eye, it goes first through a cornea, the protective clear covering, it goes through a little water pocket, the light does, and goes through the pupil. Sharks have pupils like humans, which is weird for a fish because um, sharks can dilate and constrict, make their pupils larger and smaller, which means that they can hunt well at the surface of the water as well as deep down in the water, which makes them unique. Once the light goes through that pupil, well, the iris, the dark spot around the outside adjusts the pupil. Pupil is just a hole. So the light goes through the pupil, hits the lens, which is that clear thing we can see back there, goes through this back area, which we call the vitreous humor, which is just a fluid. When you die, the water starts seeping out, so it looks like um, a grape that's starting to turn into a raisin. Okay. Blood vessels across the back, we call this the choroid plexus, or, sorry, plexus, choroid layer, choroid plexus is drawn. Then this yellow area is the retina, and that's what has rods and cones. And this is kind of the coolest thing about um, sharks. Everybody says, well, they only see black and white. But what's weird is that you have rods in your eye that detect light and dark, but you also have cones that detect three colors, red, blue, or green. All the other colors in your world, yellows, oranges, what, violets, they're all made up by your mind. The only three colors you can see are red, blue, and green. Well, sharks actually have cones, too. And I can't find that we know what colors they can see, but just the fact that they have cones says that, hey, they can tell color too. But if people keep saying, oh, just black and white. Okay. And then there's the optic nerve coming out, which we saw before. Oops, there it is. There it is. Right? There's one extra layer, the tapetum nucleosum that I mentioned earlier, it's the shiny mirror layer. It's not in this picture because this is human, but light for a shark goes in, goes through the retina, bounces off the tapetum, and then it comes back. And depending on what color the crystals are and the mirror of the tapetum, when you shine a light at a shark, um, it can be different colors. Uh, same with the dog. I don't know if I mentioned you earlier. So I have a Bouvier dog. If I shine the light at her, it comes back, it reflects back this color, this orangish kind of haunting color. But I have a friend that has a schnauzer. And if you shine the light at the schnauzer, it comes back like a blue, like a silvery blue. Cats, usually greens or yellows. Cutting in. I just made the, I did the little pinch and cut. Be careful when you cut the eye that you don't squirt it at somebody next to you or yourself. So it's kind of tough. There we go. Right. I think I've cut it completely open. So you can see this thing coming out. It's a pearl. A rich. I'm kidding. It's a lens. So when it's in the eye and the eye is alive and healthy, it's clear. It's just like a magnifying glass. If we flatten it, it lets you see far away, like a flat magnifying glass. If it's round, it makes you see things close up. It's like if you looked at a round, whoops, marble, everything just looks fat and round. As soon as you die, these living cells that were in here get cloudy. That's what gives like, when you see zombies and they always have the white eyes, Ugh. that's what it is, is that, Someone saw a dead person to draw the idea for a zombie with the clouded over lens. So really, a zombie shouldn't be able to see it. I hate debunking things, especially zombies, because they're stinking awesome, the thought of there being zombie apocalypse or whatever. But yeah, it's just not work because they wouldn't be able to see where they're going. They'd have to like smell you or something else. So that's the lens. That's the eye. If you want to, I'm not going to do it because of time. We're actually. Uh, 28 minutes over and I don't want to go more than 30 minutes. But what you can do is you can come in, you can cut through here, cut back, and you can kind of see the pattern of the brain. The brain's outline looks like this. So on the shark, you've got the olfactory areas, number one, coming back and into what's going to be the cerebellum, 
or sorry, cerebellum, cerebrum, sorry. You have optic pathways, you have the cerebellum. So this, I don't know if you see it, number five, the word is the cerebellum. It's for balance and coordination. You can see the thought area and the balance and coordination area, a shark's more concerned with its balance and coordination. Here's the brain stem and the medulla oblongata back here that control breathing, heart rate, choking, gagging, coughing, sneezing, sore throat, runny, runny nose, whatever. I tried being funny and that was just a terrible joke, but all your basic life functions are keep alive. That's the medulla oblongata. You can cut the, the shark brain out if you want. I'll let you do that. Everything else is kind of cut down. Got to an eye. We got to see a ton of stuff. Got to see the ampullae, the Lorenzini. Got to see all the GI tract. Got to see awesome fish and shrimp that came out of it. Um, and I think that's really about it. You can look at the very back. It's just a little autopsy guide. It's actually the same autopsy I guide when we do in house stem autopsies with pigs. I know, I get it. It's a necropsy, it's not an autopsy, but we have a case where uh, students go through and dissect an entire pig and we treat it at, like a forensic autopsy with, with other students. But that's everything. I'm so glad you guys got to, guys and gals, got to join me and do this today. This, this was a blast. And I'm glad that we got to send the sharks out to you. The way that you clean this up, and you don't have to do this, just listen. If you want to keep dissecting, just put everything on. But your sharks, make sure you put the pins in, and you should have six of them. Put the pins in. Make sure that your probe is either under the mat or slid into the side of the mat. Make sure your scissors are flat. Make sure everything is laying as flat as you possibly can. You throw everything here away. So you put it all on top. If you want to keep the book, <laughs> it's a mess. But uh, if you want another book, just uh, find me at Jump Simulation, drop me an email, and I'll get you a copy of the book. So. Here's how the mess is done. You can take your apron off, put it on top of the mess. If you feel safe with what's on the outside of the bag, you can take your gloves off, but I recommend actually waiting until your very last thing. All right? So you're gonna reach into the bag. Remember, there are two ends of the bag. There's one that's an opening and there's one that's closed in. Oops, the other one. You're gonna reach inside the bag. It's clean in there, right? To be clean because I might a little bit. When you reach into the bag, you're going to grab your tray. You see my finger right here coming over. And again, thanks to PNC and Jump and the University of Illinois for letting us do this. This is great. You're just going to bring it up and bring it over. I've got my whole hand underneath. I've got my other whole hand holding the tray, so you can see it here. Then, all the way through. From the bottom up. And it's all in the bag now. Completely inside the bag. Take your gloves off. When you do this, when you're ready, like I said, I don't want to rush you. If you're having fun doing this, I recommend you just keep doing it before if you're crazy. Um, safe crazy. Make sure your parents are still watching. Grab your wrist of the glove like this. Don't touch your actual skin. And then just roll it off. Crumple it up like a golf ball, like you're holding a golf ball. Take this finger that's clean. This is a clean one. Well, mine's not because I ripped my glove. But underneath, everything inside might feel a little sweaty, but it's clean. And then just pull it on over. Now, everything that's dirty, you can touch any part of the outside and it's all clean. Everything dirty is on the inside, drop it in. Close up your bag. Put it in the trash. And that was the whole thing. So all that's ready and safe. If you want, if you want us to dispose of it, you can. We're not going to keep the trays or pads or anything like that. We'll just put it in a, a, an incinerator bag and destroy it. Um, otherwise, it's safe to go in your garbage can. I would recommend tying it in a knot, <laughs> tight. Um, maybe even if you have another trash bag around, put it in there. If you're going to put it in a trash can, like 
for days at a time just so the stink doesn't get there and you don't attract raccoons or other animals to the area. But that's the whole thing. So thanks again for playing with us and being a part of this. And we'll try and put the recording online as soon as possible. So if you want to go back and watch again with the regular fish, you can do the same thing. You can do it and see what structures you find that are different from a fish compared to a shark. Um, hopefully we'll see you in class for STEM stuff or just keep watching because we're going to bring more at-home STEM projects really soon. See ya. Thanks for the waving. Talk to you later. Good, a lot of fun. It is.